Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done nearly 500 of them now. And if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu, where you'll see all the previous ones archived in several different ways. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it, um, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And if you're not comfortable with PayPal, there's also a donations page that tells you other ways you can do it. My guest today is <clears throat> Reverend Bill McDonald. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'll read a little bit of his standard bio that he sent me, but then I'll, I'll lapse out of that and let him elaborate more. What's the matter? Oh, there's a bug Some on, bug there's a bug on Irene's desk. All right, we'll, we'll look. <laughs> I have these little bugs that get in the house in the wintertime around here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't an owl. We'll talk about owls during the interview. Okay, all right. <laughs> Would have been really just cool if bug, an owl just, showed just up. Don't, what just, just don't bug me. Okay, I won't bug you. So. Uh, Reverend, Bill, Reverend Bill's life has been a spiritual journey spanning slightly over seven decades. His whole life has been a mystical trip in search of gurus, the paranormal, and self-discovery. He has written about his many spiritually transformative experiences and near-death experiences, including supernatural events during his combat tour of duty in Vietnam. In his books, he has shared some incredible spiritual events that are beyond the common understanding or explanation. And I'll be sharing them in this interview today. His autobiography, Warrior, A Spiritual Odyssey, that's this one, um, takes us on a life quest for love, understanding, forgiveness, and enlightenment. His follow-up book, here's this one, Alchemy of a Warrior's Heart, <clears throat> continues that mystical journey, including four trips to India, for even more profound experiences with holy men, miracles, and his personal relationship with the divine. What he knows for sure, after all these years, is that the only thing that is truly real is love. Um, Bill is an author, as we just displayed, an award-winning poet, motivational speaker, artist, film advisor, veteran advocate, Vietnam War veteran, in which he won the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart, 14 Air Medals, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. He has spoken around the world, including the whole list of countries, and um, he has been involved with a dozen films and documentaries, such as In the Shadow of the Blade, which was about Vietnam, I believe, and um, has been on over 800 radio and TV shows in the last 18 years. Um, so he's probably going to be kind of bored talking to me. He's done so many of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, I won't go on, but because um, you're going to learn a lot about Bill during this interview. Uh, so welcome, Bill. Well, thank you for having me on your show. Yeah. I, I checked your list of previous uh, predecessors coming on the show, so I have a lot of, a lot to own up to here and fill big boots, so I will try <laughs> my humble best. Yeah, well, as you and I were, Bill and I were talking for about half an hour before we started here, and... Uh, he, we were, he was talking about the variety of people I've interviewed and kind of what a variety of spiritual people there are out there in the world of all different types and flavors. And we were just reflecting on how, isn't that kind of true of the universe itself as a, as a display of the divine intelligence, which just gives rise to such diversity and abundance and, and displays such creativity. So, and we were also talking about how you know, there's no one path to the divine or any such thing, and it's good to be appreciative of everybody's path, regardless of what form it may take. Well, that's that, that's kind of my philosophy. It's uh, if somebody comes to me and they got a certain religious belief or a certain faith or whatever it is or path, if they're happy, I'm happy for them. Yeah. I don't want to change anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's working for you, go with it. We, we all don't eat the same flavor ice cream. That's why they got 32 flavors, right? <laughs> so uh, some people like chocolate, some people like vanilla, some people like tutti frutti. So uh, when, it, when it comes to our spiritual quest, it is exactly that, our spiritual quest. So what do we need this lifetime? What do we need to add to this diversity of this rainbow we have? 
what energy do we have to give and, and share? And it's not so much about getting, it's about serving. As I've heard some of your guests talk about before, uh, in India, they got this whole thing about serving at the ashram and serving your guru and serving. To me, it's it's always about that. Whether you're serving your community, your family, you're, you're serving your wife, you're serving your children. It's not about giving. It's about, uh, or it's about giving. It's not about getting. Right. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. Nice. Um, as one begins to read your books, you know. You get the feeling like, holy mackerel, this really, this guy has really <laughs> been through it. I mean, from your early childhood, and let's go through some of it. I mean, just to give and and one thing that you say later on, or I guess I heard it in an interview. I don't. It's probably in one of your books someplace. Is that you were told by some kind of palm reader or somebody or tarot reader or somebody in India that your soul is of the type that kind of volunteers. To to come here again and again and take on a lot of suffering. It, yeah, and you got, you have to realize that I don't make any pretentious, uh, you know, this is it because somebody said it. But the readers, my naughty palm reader, uh, according to the charts and the astral charts, you know, with the, uh, the Indian astrology, uh, they all said the same thing, that this is something I volunteered for and I'm taking it on again and again and again. Now. Whether that's real, whether that's truth, it makes no difference to me. The only thing that's important uh, is who I am right now in this moment. Because I hear a lot of people, they, they talk about their past lives and, and this and that. And, and I go, you know what? It doesn't matter because you can't prove any of it. The only thing you can prove is who you are, but how you live your life. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I'm at. So it's like I, I wake up every day and I try to be the best me I can be. Yeah, and uh, and I'm finding out that I'm better today than I was yesterday. Of course, I'm older today, <laughs> but but I'm but I'm better in other ways. So uh, yeah, I I definitely see that uh, when I was in my when I was in my teens, I thought I was smart. When I was in my twenties, I knew I knew, knew everything. In my thirties, I was right on it. And now, mm -hmm. as I got into my seventies, I'm realizing I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And what I did know. The only thing I really know is love. That's the only thing that's guaranteed I know. I know when I'm loved and I know when I give love yeah. and I feel right. love. Everything else is theory. You know, it's what difference does it make? Right. Yeah, and I've heard you say God is love. Uh, and obviously that's a almost like a cliche bumper sticker phrase, you know, that people say. Um, so. Well, what is what does that mean to you that God is love, and how do you reconcile that with all the suffering that you've encountered and that people in the world experience? People, and here's the thing. Let's talk about suffering. First off, there's pain. There's painful things that happen to people. There's what could be classified as negative aspects of their life and their life experience. But suffering is a choice. Pain sometimes you can't avoid. It's it's on track for your life course. It's part of your journey. But choosing to suffer or not suffer, that's the key. What I believe that everything yeah. is made in God's image. That means atoms, everything, table, rock, you, the dog, every, every, everything's made the same thing. And I think that what holds that substance together, what holds those molecules together, the, the quarks, the strings, the, the atoms, whatever, that energy is love. It's light. You can call it light. You can call it love. You can call it om. You can call it whatever you want. But it's basically, I feel it as love. And so I experience life on a scale of how do I measure life? It's all measured by love. How much love and light is, is generated? And to me, light and love is everywhere. If, if you open your eyes, better yet, if you open your heart, you'll not only see it, you'll find it and you'll generate it for others. One way I would understand what you just said is that, you know, love um, abhors disunity. Love wants to unify. And it's a unifying force between people, between people and animals, between anything that where love is displayed or expressed. It's, it's, it's uniting. So, you know, when you say that the quarks and the strings and all that are, uh, you know, un are kind of united by love, and, and when we say that God is love, 
then maybe we could say that, yeah, what we experience subjectively as love is the human experience of a, a deeper force in the universe that, um, that kind of binds it together and keeps it, um, keeps it functioning. Could you say that? You said it wonderful. <laughs> You're going to find if you talk to me long enough that I'm a very simple soul. Mm -hmm. I'm a simple guy. Uh, I am more childlike than I am adult-like. Uh, I don't use highfalutin words. I don't use all these great philosophies and quote. I don't quote any books. Uh, all these great Indian classics. I, it's so you know, what are the stories? I don't know them, or I've heard them and I don't remember them. I function on the level of what I experience. And if I experience something and I tell somebody and they go, oh, that's mm -hmm. Samadhi, that's this, that, that. <laughs> I, I don't care. I experienced it, I felt the love. That's all that counts. It doesn't matter if it has a, 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 a analytical title, if you can classify it. I don't, if I have an ex, a, a mystical experience, quote unquote, uh, I don't analyze it. And you read my books, you know that things happen and they happen often and, and, and you know in this this book here alchemy which is 250 pages and you go wow that's got a lot of stuff in there the original manuscript was 650 pages i had more stories that i could use so I, I said you know what let's just get to the heart of it and i condensed it down i mean there's why write about 25 out-of-body experiences one will do yeah you, you know We'll talk about this or that one ex example that's good enough because God has such a diversity the universe is so diverse there's so many unique experiences and I shared them not to say hey look look at me here's a spotlight I talked about this earlier and, and uh, with you with Irene I, I shared them so other people could take that journey with me because a lot of people out there good people good souls even people that are praying and meditating and doing all these things and nothing ever happens. Yeah. And to me, the people with the greatest faith are those that meditate with no fit, no tangible results and they continue to do it anyway. They get up early in the morning, they do it. At night, they do it. <laughs> you know, they're in love with God. It doesn't matter. Anything happens, great. They have faith. It'll happen if it's supposed to happen. They have more faith than I do because I sit down, things happen. Anybody can have faith that they have the experience I've had. I mean, anybody. I mean, if you, you saw all these neat things and, and healings and stuff and visions, and but the person that has no experience, to me, they're operating on a level of pure love. And I, and I always love these people for that. And I tell them, don't give up. Just, just keep going. That was actually one of my primary motivations for starting this show about almost 10 years ago was that, you know, I live in a town where several thousand people have been meditating for decades and uh, I knew a lot that they were having great experiences and breakthroughs and all kinds of cool stuff and I knew a lot of others that were feeling discouraged and disheartened because they weren't having those experiences and and therefore they even doubted that these other people were having them who said they were and I thought well let me just kind of showcase some of these people who are having these experiences let them share them more publicly so people can see that their peers are actually you know, getting the promised result of all this spiritual practice. And uh, and it, it just kind of took off, you know. And then after a while, I, I started by interviewing people here in town, but then it kind of branched out. But that's been one of the primary motivations for this, is to give people everywhere the sense that this spiritual development thing is real and that it's worth pursuing and that it's available to everybody, not just somebody who seems to be special or saint-like or famous or anything like that. Which, which gets me to this whole special thing. There is no special race. There's no special religion. There's no special people. When you're all special, nobody's special, <laughs> right? When you're all God, then how could one part of God be greater than the other part of God? Yeah. Which which lends you to this whole thing about, well, how about these bad guys out there? These people doing evil things. Well, they're still part of God. It's all God. And once you see there's no differences between anything it brings a great peace to one and uh i, I think people need to realize that uh, they don't have to be special you know a lot of religions out there and i'll say a lot of cults and religions they the, the the leader will 
inflate people's ego and you know and give them titles and things and that and, you know and if they feel special because they're with somebody no the lowest person there may be the most advanced you, you don't know how it goes so treat everybody as a saint treat everybody as a sage because you know something in the ever presence of having no time and no space being all time is now that's true everybody is a saint a sage a rishi everybody's an ascended master already they just haven't awakened in this moment yeah to realize that this parallel space over here is parallel time in the future you call it they're not you know they are they're, they're this great being and uh so that's why people that meditate it's said that they can lessen their karma and you wonder how that happens because if they're meditating now and they're doing these things and praying and stuff they're actually helping evolve themselves in the past as well as evolving themselves mm -hmm. in the future mm -hmm. so you've already changing your past past is not in stone and neither is the future and so these people that follow like you know i've had i've had readings and stuff if you follow that stuff According to my, according to some of my charts that I've had and some of my readings, I, sh I should have been dead. 2016 was the last time somebody told me it was my death day. I mean, uh, and I always, and I always say no, no. I'll know, but that's not it. No. Yeah. And, and how can one truly know that when they're going to die? Even though I've been told, God knows. And w and when you're done being used, and you filled your dharma what you were supposed to do and you haven't given up then it'll be your time to go but as long as you still got as, long as i still got an ounce of of energy physical energy spiritual energy mental energy um i have a list of things i'm still doing i still have people that i still need to meet now you know well, let me let me tell you a story okay because I, I i believe you read alchemy i don't know if you read towards the back where i have a heart surgery Yes, uh, I was. I read that part. Okay, so let me talk about that because it ties into the naughty palm reading, which was where we were kind of at. Maybe explain what a naughty palm reading is also before. Okay, you, yeah. I was a complete ignoramus, you know, and that's just being very gentle with it. I had knew nothing about it. When I was at the ashram in Pune, and, and the guru off comes to me and he says, Be he, He's your guru, okay, and, and he has an ashram in Pune, which is in India, just filling in the blanks here. Go ahead. There you, there you go, and he goes, Bill, I want you to go down downtown Pune, and I want you to get a naughty palm reading. And I'm going, I'm thinking, reading my palm, you know, that's what I'm thinking, reading a palm, you know. And I go, I don't want no fortune telling, you know, I, you know, I don't need a mentalist act or something. He says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, they don't read your palm. He says, this is ancient readings that they did 2,500 to 5,000 years ago. And I go, what are you talking about? And he says, well, the great rishis of India, these holy men, they sat down and they channeled information for people coming in the future. And the future, I don't know how far the future stretches, but it was from up to 5,000 years ago. So you figured it's still going today. So it's probably hundreds or thousands of years more. I'm not sure. But they did millions of these. And they did these readings and they had a scribe write them on a palm leaf on the hard part of the palm, you know, they cut the fronds off and just the, the wood. And they wrote ancient Sanskrit or whatever it was on there. And then they shellacked them and they saved these. And it was said that when you needed to have this information, when that soul needed that information for that particular lifetime, because you could have several different lifetimes you're getting these things. I mean, you know, you, you come in at 1800 and 1900 or whatever. But when you're ready to have it, you'll find it. And uh, so he told me that, and I'm going, yeah, okay, yeah, real great. I, I said, I really don't want to do this. He said, I don't believe it. And he says, no, for you, it's real. You don't have to believe in it. It's real. And I go, yeah. I said, well, how, how are they going to find mine? So he goes, well, they, they take your thumbprint. Now, and let me just interject a question here. So they didn't yeah. do one of these for every person who was ever going to be born, which would be billions of them, but they, they, they knew that Select. if you went there, then they, they knew who was going to actually come to, to get the reading and they did it for those people is that right that's the way it sounded to me okay 
and you'll probably have people on your show that are probably could explain this whole thing. You know, they're naughty chart people or something. But to me, the simple explanation was, if you're supposed to have this, it's there. If not, it's not there. Okay. That's so that was good enough for my feeble, childlike mind. I, so my guru tells it to me so I can explain it. But when he says they classify this by thumbprint, I'm just going, wait a minute. Thumbprint? He says, yeah, you give me your, your left thumbprint or, or your right thumbprint if you're a man, left thumbprint if you're a woman. And then they look up in the files and stuff. And, and I said, I mean, they got these things filed by thumbprint. Then he explained to me that unlike astrology where you got 12 zodiac signs, you got 108 different indentations on, on your thumb. So you got like 108 different subgroups. Hmm. I said, okay, so you got a million, so you divide up 108, you still got tens of thousands of potentials, right? So he says, no, 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 they'll, they'll find it. And then, and then I, and I said, well, he says, uh, and he says, I believe yours is going to be in Pune. I said, what do you mean in Pune, you believe? Are they elsewhere? And he goes, yes. He says, they used to be all in one location. And then when the British were there, they were stealing some of the, the, the you know, the, the scrolls and the, the palm leaves. And uh, there was a fire destroyed some. So they took the collection of these from all the rishis and they divided them up. I don't know what the number is. I've heard 12, 15, 19, 20. But there's various locations all around India itself where these things are stored. So even if you had one, right? And you went looking for this, and you go into Pune, it could be in Delhi. It could be in Calcutta. It could be in Mumbai. It's, so when he told me that, I'm going, oh, okay, what's the chances of finding this thing? He says, for you, it'll be there. So I go to this place, and uh, I told my friends and went with me. I said, don't call me by my name. Don't exchange any conversation. We're not going to give these guys any heads up, because I've seen... I've seen Las Vegas mentalist acts, and I know how it works, right? They listen in, you know, and they pick up, yeah, you got a wedding ring, you're married, you know, and they, they pick up stuff. Now, wait a minute, your, your guru knew a lot about you. Is there any chance he could have talked to them and give, filled them in? Actually, on he, actually, he didn't know that much about me. He, 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 uh, he didn't know parents' names. He didn't know, at that time, he didn't. I don't Where your he, wife went to college and all that kind of stuff? None, none of that stuff, no. Okay. Yeah, he, there's a lot of stuff he didn't know. Because, yeah, that thought occurred to me, too. Maybe just calling ahead, you know, it's just buddies, <laughs> you know. But my, my guru didn't even know my birth date. So I go there. I sit down. I give him a thumbprint. And they go, put your initial next to your name. And I'm going, ah, okay. I don't go by William, but I'll put W. You know, let's, let's just test these guys, right? So I put W next to the initial, you know, and, and then the thumbprint. And an hour later, they call me in this little room, about the size of this little computer room. And it's got an altar. And they must have, seriously now, 75 to 100 incense sticks burning. I mean, it's like rolling smoke. I mean, it's like, whew, you know, every order you think of. And then it's got candles lit. It's got Catholic candles. It's got Jesus statues. It's got Buddhas. It's got Krishna. It, it, it's, it's got Shiva. It's got all the gods. It's got everybody. They leave anybody out. And I'm going, okay, fine. So this guy walks in, this Indian, and he's carrying what looks like Anisha blinds, Phoenician blinds, you know, the, the about this long, and they're uh, the solid material from the palm leaves, and, and they're strung together with strings, so they're all stacked together. So he had like 20 minutes stack. And he takes it out, and he goes through, he says, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and as soon as you say no, that's not your that's not your leaf. We, we leave that. We go to the next one. Okay. So based on your thumbprint, this stack someplace should be yours. I said, okay. So he asked, nah, 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 no, no. So he gets to get through with the sixth one. And he says, okay, intuitively, this is the reader. Intuitively, I know the seventh one is yours. He said, but just answer yes or no. And I said, okay. Which is not yes or no. I said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I laughed. He didn't laugh. Anyway, so... <laughs> So he goes, your name is four letters long. I said, okay, good guess. I go, yes, because I go by Bill. And he says that it starts with B. I put W on my initial out there, and he goes, B, right? And then he goes, and then he reads it off the thing. He goes, B-I-L-L, -L, Bill, Bill, 
And I go, yeah, Bill, yes. And he says, and your father's name was exactly the same as yours. Notice he says was and exactly. Was being he was died. I only found out a few months before that that my father died in 1973, and this was 2010, I think. So I, I just found out recently my father has died. So that's information I wouldn't have had. I had been there the year before. So then he goes, and the name's exactly the same. I am William H. McDonald, Jr. My father was William H. McDonald, Sr. So it's exactly the same name. And I'm going, okay, that's an impressive guest. I'm thinking, man, you know, what, what these guys? They go to Winnipeka or something? You know, where would they dig this up at? So then he goes, and your mother's name was, meaning she's dead, and she died in 1990. And see, my guru didn't know that, didn't know anything about that. And her name was, and he mispronounced it, he says, Marcella, he spelled it out, Marcella. And all, all this Sanskrit on this thing written, or whatever it's written in, whatever language it's written in, Bill and Marcella are spelled out in English letters. Now realize when I wrote these things, I don't know what the relationship was England. I don't know if they had English letters in India or not, but it's in there with English letters. They didn't have it 2,500 years ago, that's for sure. No, so it's like- I don't even so think they had it in England back then. <laughs> yeah, so, so where did that come from, right? Plus Marcella is an Italian name. All right, so that kind of threw me for a loop. I'm thinking, that's odd. I didn't think maybe the guy added it later, but I saw how old this thing was. I mean, it was all crinkly and falling apart. And I thought, wow, well, I don't know if it's 2,500 years, but it looked like it was at least seven or 800 years old. I'm thinking maybe they redo those things as they start to, do, you know, you know, okay. rot or something at age. Mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that because it didn't look 2,500 years. It looked like it was hundreds of years old, though. And then he goes, uh, and your mother's dead. And I go, yes. And he says, and your wife's name is Carol. And I go, wow, okay, I was impressed with that. I got my wife's name. And she graduated from a prestigious university in America. So 2,500 years ago, there was no America, right? So some of this may be his intuition putting it together from the pieces I'm thinking, because I, I can't read what he's got there. But he says America, so maybe that was his add-on. So I'm, I'm thinking all these things in my mind, you know, because I'm a skeptic. I don't want to accept anything at face value. So, and he goes, um, he says, we don't have a word for this in India. He says, but when you were growing up, he says, it was something like being a foster kid. You're, one of your parents, your dad wasn't there. I go, that's true. And you were separated from both your parents for a, a period of probably a year. And I was, I said, yes. And you wrote from reading my book, I was in the hospital for a year as a child, taken away from my parents. <laughs> Uh, and so there I was alone. So nobody knew that at the ashram. Nobody. So that was an interesting piece of information. I went, oh, okay. And then he goes, and you got a son and a daughter. And he gave some information on them and the birth order and everything else. And they were married. And, and then he says, and they both love you. And then, of course, I couldn't answer yes or no in that because that's what I'd like to think versus what they think. You know, you have to ask them, I said. So then he goes, your birthday, and so I said, okay, let's see where he goes with this. I figured he could guess a year, maybe. I don't know how old I look, but, you know, I'm, I'm 73 in a couple of weeks, so you, you could tell this was a few years ago. And he goes, your birthday's March 16th, 1946. <clears throat> yes. He says, well, we're unsure of the hour, the time. He says, we think it's one o'clock, between 1.10 and 1.30 in the morning, but we're, for some reason... They couldn't get it right. Now, what he didn't know was that when I was born, there was no doctor there. I, they gave, my, all right, this is terrible, but they gave my mother an enema when she was in the hospital, expect you know, to get ready to deliver. And she says, I'm getting ready to deliver. No, no, we'll be the judge of that, right? So while the doctor was gone, the nurse was there, I I was delivered, you know, just right into the, head first into a, a into bedpan. The, uh, bedpan, thank you. So instead of a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born with a bunch of crap. So that was kind of like the beginning. <laughs> anyway, but they didn't know the story because the doctor was sent for. So the doctor 
didn't pronounce me born until he got there. And they tried to take a guess at what time. So the doctor was trying to guess between 1.10 and 1.30, and I think he guessed about 1.15 or 1.20 or something. Anyway, so nobody knows the exact minute of my birth. And in this reading, they didn't know my exact minute of my birth either, which is unusual for these things. Usually they pretty sharp. And so when he told me that, that was an interesting thing because it was historically, yeah, I mean, I didn't even know the answer to that. So then he went through a whole bunch of other questions and he goes, I'm going to tell you this piece of information. He says, but I'm going to change it because what's written here is ant antiquated is because they didn't know about things like they do now. He says, so my intuition says this is what they meant. He says, you just recently, meaning within just a few weeks, you recently worked on a movie. He says, and this thing here, he says, you worked on a play. But he says, intuition tells me when I'm doing this, that's not a play. It's a real movie. He says, they didn't have movies back then, so you know there's no vocabulary for it anymore. He says, but you just recently worked on a movie, but not as an actor. And I go, yeah. And nobody at the ashram knew that I just helped with the ending of a movie called, uh, whatever it was going, I can't think of that one about the blade. Uh, no, that was another movie. Anyway, okay. I just, I just worked on the, I saw the, the film clip on this and I didn't like the ending of the movie. And I suggested to the, uh, the director, he needed a more happy, upbeat ending. And so I got involved with this thing. And, uh, and so I made a suggestion and the director just went really great with it and did even better than I suggested. And, but nobody knew that story. So the point is this, had I gone there the year before or the year before that or the year, next year, that statement wouldn't have been correct. Because no, it wouldn't have never matched. Right. So that was the time, and the guy told me, this is to tell you this is, this is the right time for you to get this. Mm -hmm. So then he went through uh, telling me about birth in this lifetime all the way up to the moment I walked into there. And that stuff was right on. And that was interesting because I looked at that saying, that's a better reading than somebody reading your future, which you don't know if it's anything. And reading the past, which could be all make-believe, you know, make you feel good, everybody's this and that. You can't bank on either of those two. But the guy tells you all the stuff leading up to walking in there, uh, that kind of gets your attention. Because you say, wait a minute, this guy's reading the now moment and previous nows in my memory. And then he went on and he goes, you are supposed to, it's your dharma, it's your duty to write a book talking about your guru and Lord Shiva. And at the time I was working on it. In fact, I was in the middle of working on it. And here's this reading that says, this is what I was supposed to do. And then the guy goes, in spite of the fact that when you write this book, people are going to say, who does Bill think he is? I mean, you know, he's telling all your stories and all this, you know. So in spite of that, take those beatings. That's okay. Because in the end, they're going to smile upon your guru. They're going to smile upon Lord Shiva. You're going to bring people to them. And it's not about you, even though the book will look like it's written about you. In the end, it's about their energy. It's about spiritual quest for not just you, but for others. It's about taking people on a spiritual journey. Write the book so other people are taking the journey. So he's giving this whole talk about that. And I'm going, wow. So I talked to you earlier about that. That's why when I wrote this book, it's really written, especially the second book. The, the reader gets into it. It's them on the journey. And I don't give you a heads up how I felt later on, a year later, two years later, retrospect. It's how I felt then. You know, what I didn't know then and what I know later doesn't count. And I take people on that same just journey of discovery. That's how I wrote the book. And that's how I was told to write the book. But they also warned me you know, I'd get criticism. I mean, you know, even Have some it? people... Some people, yeah, overwhelmingly not. I expected more, 
Well, it's an autobiography. Autobiographies are about one's life, and yes. I don't think you come across as boastful or anything. You're just telling them you had all these fire experiences that most people don't have, but you're just talking about them. And, and, and what's interesting is I've had several people that I got, they're in the chapters that say, were never with me for something. And they've come back to me later after they read the book and they go, wait a minute, I was with you during this. You're, you're under telling what happened. <laughs> and, and, and a couple of, one of them goes, I thought you were braggart. I thought you were exaggerating. He says, I'm finding out that everything you wrote about that I know about in there, you've brought the level down. You've under told it. You could have said so much more. And I go, yeah. I felt what I said was going to be hard enough for people to believe as it was. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I didn't want to go that far. I just want to take people to the edge. Yeah. All right. All right. So then, then they go, and he goes, uh, 30 questions. And he goes, yes, yes, yes. One of the questions was, your, he says, your guru is Lord Shiva. And I'm going, well, that's impossible. Nobody's, nobody's a disciple of, of Shiva. And then he's just, the next breath, he just goes, your guru is growing off, your present guru. And then I'm thinking, oh. he just said Shiva was my guru, and now he's saying growing off. So it's like, it's just like Russian dolls, you know, it's, it's, it's all at one, you know, is the guru one, is it, it you know. So that had me question. I said, yes, I, 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 I don't know, I guess I'm a lover of Shiva. So he gets through, and I thought he was done, so I, 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 I reach into my jacket, I get out my wallet, and I start to pay him, and he goes, no, 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 no. That's not the reading. I go, what do you mean that's not the reading? He says, no, no, no. Now we got an index card. Now we know where to go to get your files. That was just to find out if we had the right person. I go, oh. That was just so like go, doing a blood test before giving you a transfusion or something. They just want to make sure you had the bl right blood type. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, you know, and, uh, anyway, so it's like my blood type, which is be positive, which is my whole life, right? Yeah, be positive. That's my theme. Right? So anyway, uh, so six hours later, I'm still sitting around there, and they're, they're working these uh, Vedic charts upstairs, and they got a guy that's reading them in one language. I have an interpreter, uh, Froze, I think the guy's name was, real nice man, really nice man, and he was there for me to interpret it from this old language uh, into... English for me and uh, and so I went upstairs there was the three of us and we sat down and and he read my previous life because my guru told him I had to tell him I want my worst sin from from the past revelant life you know that, that ties me to today's situation but it, I got out the guru wanted to know my worst sin was and I just, and I basically ended up having to share that when I got back to the Asher. now the people that had it ahead of me there was people that, you know, tortured somebody, cut off a head, you know, adultery. I'm all kinds. Of, I mean, just theft, wars. I'm, oh my God, my worst sin. What is this going to be about, right? So now realize this just makes a great story because there is no proof positive about anything that I'm about to tell you. And so, what credence anybody gives, it's 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 on faith. So I'm giving it in the same way it was given to me. So people can accept it or not. This is what was given to me. So basically the guy says, in the most significant past life that connects you today with your guru, you had a lifetime in Shri, what's now Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, yeah. And you were at your present guru's ashram. You were his senior monk, his brahmachari or whatever. You were his main guy. And... He loved you, you had a great relationship, you were friends, you did all these services, you were a good man, but you committed a hideous crime. Oh my God, what did I do? He says, you had a fleeting thought about a woman. You, you, had, you actually had a, you fell in love emotionally with a woman. And your thought about that, when you've taken the vows, the guru sensed that and kicked you out, and you went wandering the rest of your life. This is what they're telling me. And you went wandering the rest of your life, uh, with, you know, like a fool with a crazy head. And uh, some years later, according to the chart, you ended up back in India, bathing in the Ganges. You go down underwater and you come up 
And there in a blaze of light is Lord Shiva. And I'm saying, well, the only way you can see Lord Shiva is you're dead. And then next thing he says, and yes, you leave it a rainbow body with Lord Shiva. And according to his chart, and, accord, and this makes a great story, again, credence, who knows. And he goes, every lifetime that we can go back and look in this, every lifetime, at least 10 here, every time you leave, you leave in a rainbow body. You reach a point, you remember your, who you are, what you are, what your purpose is, and then you go. Does rainbow body, what does rainbow body mean exactly? Um, literally, I was all light. I mean, was your physical light. body still floating in the Ganges, nope. but your subtle body went out? Is that it? I didn't even know if the body was there physically anymore. I was, all I remember was, he's saying, you just turned into a rainbow. You just, whoosh, and you're gone. All right, so then he, he tried to say, this is the way you ended every life and the way you'll end this life. And I go, well, okay, that's a great fairy tale. I'd like to believe it, but who knows? You'll have to come back to me the next lifetime and ask me that question. So I, I will tell you if I pass over. Okay. I'm not even too sure I want to go yet. So, <laughs> uh, so then he goes through and he says, now the reason we're telling you that past story is when you had that fleeting thought, it was just a fleeting thought. You didn't take no action on it, had no desire to do it. The guru put a curse on your mind. I go, oh my God, a curse. And this lifetime, when you met your guru, what's the first thing he did for you? Well, I knew the guru just within an hour or two. I was having epileptic seizures, a couple hundred a year. And when I met this guru, he just hadn't had one since, since 2008. There's another whole story that we could talk on that. But anyway, so the, the guy doing the reading says, what's the first thing the guru did for you? He took back that, gave you back your mind. Uh -huh. And that's so you would believe and know that these two are connected. I'm going, okay, that makes a good story, but how'd that reader know that I had epilepsy? How do you know that I had a problem? So that was kind of interesting. So then he did a reading for the future. And he says, he says, most people, we got a lot to say. He says, yours is a very short block of time. And he says, almost everybody can change their future. I mean, that's, you got free will, you got this and that, he says, but some people, and he says, you're one of these people because of your dharma, your duty, what you're supposed to do, stuff is pretty much locked into stone. I mean, you can still mess it up, you can still change it, but it's pretty much in stone that this is what you're going to do. I mean, you still got the free will to mess things up, but this is pretty much, they're pretty positive this stuff is going to happen. And so he went down all these things that were going to happen with my health, with uh, a couple of neat things, which I'm going to go into the operation on and tell you where they came into. And uh, and then he says, and you're going to write this book about your guru, and you're going to spend your last years of your life talking about Shiva and your guru, and you will win people over. And it's not about you, it's about them in the end. And that's your duty and you're supposed to do it. And and then he gave me when I was going to die and how I was going to die and all that. But the only caveat was, and then I think, well, yeah, okay, and they got something to cover the bases, right? You make a prediction, then you go, there's a... If Lord Shiva or Babaji or your guru have a task for you that's undone, then you'll be given that time to do it. But when you've finished your pat your plate, when it's done, if you serve everything you're supposed to do, then here's what happens. So I won't go into that, but but I've looked at a lot of other people's. Nobody gets death prediction. They just don't do that. First off, there's variables out there. First off, it's something you shouldn't know. Um, it didn't upset me. It actually made it easier for me when I went through all these other things later on in my life. So there was a reason for me to know. And it also put me into a speed up mode. All of a sudden it was like, you know, I got sand slipping through the hourglass. I can't just sit around here and wait to finish that book and wait to go and do these things. All right, so now let's go where I was going. I'm going to a near death experience, a near death like experience. 
My next year, I go to India, and I have a major heart attack when I'm there. Um, I'm introducing Gurunath to these Indian audiences. I introduce them to the Women's Club of, of Pune, 300 of the most influential women in, in that part of India. They all spoke English, and you know, even, even to each other. Nobody spoke the native language. It was like everybody was college educated. All right. And then I introduced them in Mumbai and different places. And there's one venue I didn't introduce them. I, somebody else did. And I was sitting up in the stands. All of a sudden, I have a heart attack. I, and I fall down, and I'm in the back row. And nobody sees me. I'm laying down. And all of a sudden, the guru's giving them this uh, Surya, uh, this meditation exercise where you get power from the sun. And he stops the normal, what he was doing. And all of a sudden, he's telling these thousands of people in the audience, they're all kind of going, what's going on? He says, I want everybody to focus on the energy of the sun. Now I want you to focus on the energy of the heart. I want you to connect the heart and the sun and the energy going from the sun to the heart, the sun to the heart. And he goes on for like 10 minutes on the sun to the heart and the energy. And people are going, we've never heard this before, right? Meanwhile, I'm dying, laying down. And nobody's even seen me laying down in the crowd. And I'm getting better and better and better and better. Pretty soon I'm standing up. And then he stops. And, uh, and he calls me up on the stage, you know, and, I'm, and he says, you make too much work for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I got to keep saying, anyway, all right, so now, Guru Mata, his, his uh, beautiful wife, saintly being, she goes, Bill, you have to leave India, time to go home. Don't come back until you're healthy again. So I'm at the ashram the last day, and I'm sitting there in the kitchen and there's like four people there and this kind of brings up a point because people say well how come this person sees his angels i didn't see anything this person's delusional i didn't see nothing i didn't feel nothing so here's a, here's an example four people in the room this one beautiful lady uh, from scandinavia but she was uh, a teacher of of yoga you know the exercise and you know, all that stuff and she just knew to meditation and uh She's sitting there, and I feel somebody looking at me, and I turn around, and sitting there, or standing there, is Shiva Teshwar, a vision, lifelike body of Shiva Teshwar. <coughs> Growing up, uh, uh, it almost looks like him, but I'm telling you, it was Shiva Teshwar. And, and I, I just want to add that Sri Yakteshwar, or Yakte, however it's pronounced, was Yogananda's guru, so go ahead. And... He's standing there with his hands behind his, his his waist, and he's just looking at me. And I'm going, and I'm feeling this great, great love. My kundalini energy, my spine's kind of going doo -doo 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 -doo, like helicopters, right? You know that feeling. And uh, and I'm going. I wonder if anybody else sees this, right? So I turn around, and I ask that girl, "Do you see anything behind me?" No, I don't see nothing. We're crazy. There's nothing going on. There's, you know. So she had this guy from Texas, a uh, young man from Texas. I go, do you see what you see with anything behind me? And he goes, he says, there's a blaze of light behind you. And he says, and, and I'm feeling loved. And I go, okay. And then, believe it or not, there was a, a, a Brian Yosevich. Uh, a young lawyer from Los Angeles, a lawyer. So even they, even lawyers can be spiritual. I'm sorry, Brian. I had to make a joke. But anyway, so Brian is sitting there and he goes, you ain't going to believe this, Bill. And I said, try me. He says, I see Sivar Teshwar standing there like Gurnoff always does with his hands behind his back, looking at you the exact same way he does. And I go, yes, Brian. It's exactly what I see. So there was a situation where the guy had been practicing a real long time, Brian, really into his meditation, and open, open heart, receptive, sees exactly what I see, which verifies what I'm seeing. Another guy had meditated a good length of time, but his energy was that level where he could see the energy, the light, and feel the love, but he couldn't make out the whole image. But he see the brightness of the light. He knows there's a great being there. And the other one, so it makes you sometimes, children see things and we don't. That's you know, what you believe, right? Sure. You gotta be open to it. Dogs smell right. things that we don't, and so on. All right, yeah. so I get on an airplane, I fly back, I collapse, 
at the airport uh, in customs in Denver, Colorado, coming back to Sacramento. And paramedics got me for six hours. And I'm telling them, look, I, I got to get back. I'm, I'm going to see my heart doctor, cardiologist. Because so. they were reluctant to put me on an airplane. They go, oh, okay, it's two hours. They gave me an exam medical just before I got on the airplane. And I was told at the other end I had to see a doctor immediately. No way they should have let me on the airplane. I mean, I can't. There's no way they would do that, but they did, right? You don't let a guy that's collapsed at the airport get on an airplane and fly. Come on. Anyway, so I so I fly to Sacramento, and then next thing you know, I, I go see the doctor. and I go in the doctor's office, and he takes a listen, and he goes, nope, calls for a wheelchair, sends me to the ER. Next thing you know, I'm in intensive care, four days intensive care because they can't even operate on me because I, I'm so low. I mean, the energy is just uh, practically gone. So four days of that, I they put me in an ambulance. They transfer me to another hospital from Kaiser. They take me to Mercy Hospital in Sacramento. And I get there, and they prepare me for the next day. They're going to do uh, open heart bypass surgery, quadruple uh, bypass surgery. And my wife comes in. She goes, should I worry? I said, no, it's not my time. <laughs> not my time. She says, okay, because, you know, okay. So next day I go in there and I'm laying on the table, you know, that cold metal table they put you on and you're naked, right, you know, and, and they're getting ready to cut you up, you know. And, and if you know anything about open heart surgery, well, they're going to take what looks like pruning shears, and they cut all your ribs, right? They're going to split it open. And and then they're going to put ice or something in there. Somehow they're going to stop your heart. Before they do that, they've, they've hooked up one of your arteries to a heart-lung machine. So they stop your lungs, and they stop your heart. And you're being kept alive, oxygenated, by a little box that's got tubes coming and going from it. And I listen to this stuff, I said, wow, it's like I'm dead. He says, well, yeah, you're, yeah, you're artificially being kept alive. Basically, I said, I guess you are dead, because if the electricity goes out, you're dead. I go, oh, okay, good. I said, am I going to feel anything? He says, well, unfortunately, he says about 5% of the people that go on this bypass machine, because we have to bring down the amount of uh, anesthesia we give you, uh, they feel something. You'll feel pushing, shoving, poking. You'll, you'll know we're doing something. I said, okay, I got no choice now, right? I'm getting ready to shove going out, right? I find myself unconscious on the table. Boom. My heart has stopped. My lungs stopped. I'm, I'm gone. I'm no longer at the table. I have transversed the continent. I'm, I'm in India. All of a sudden, I'm looking around, and I'm dressed like I normally dress in India. I'm just, you know, and I'm looking around. And one of the predictions from the Nadi reading was that I was supposed to go to this temple in the south seek it out, and then walk uphill two to four hours up this hill, and I'd know where to stop. But at the top of this hill will be waiting for me all the rishis, the ascended ones or whatever. All the rishis will be waiting for me. Not to impart knowledge upon you, but only to reopen, and so you, you remember it, the knowledge. So basically, they're just opening the book for you. Here you go. You no longer have to ask questions. You can answer them yourself. I'm going, oh, okay, fine. So that's what I was told there. So in this surgery experience where I'm leaving my body, guess where I'm at? I'm at this temple. How do I know it's that temple? Intuitively, I said, this has got to be the temple, right? Because I can't say any Indian names. I couldn't remember the name of it. But I'm going, the guy told me it's going to be six to eight hours of surgery. I got time to walk up this hill. <laughs> and I walk up the hill. And I'm in a physical body. I'm walking past people. I'm in a body. Was it a dreamlike experience, or was it as real no. as if you were there in your physical like, body? Like, better than this. Okay. It'd be like you were sitting physically right in front of me. It was like physical. Yeah. And uh, so I get to the top of the hill, and they're sitting on a log, a couple of stumps, some rocks, standing around. Are these guys with beard, funny hair? I mean, but I knew who they were. I couldn't tell you now the names. I knew who they were. And they were standing there. 
There was a little fireplace, you know, a little fire pit going. How many of them were there? I don't know, at least close to a couple dozen. I don't okay. know. Okay. All, right. all I know is they were there. That was all the guys were supposed to be there. That's all I remember. Details of that. See, I got, I'm a child. I just enjoy the moment. It's like, you know, somebody else got to go, let's see, how many people, what they were, there's any smells, any sights, any, you know, I don't do that. I just go, okay, here I am. And standing amongst them, on, you know, I didn't see it first, was Gornoff. He's standing with these guys. <clears throat> you know, his arms folded, you know, just standing there. So I walk up there and I sit on the rock. And, and I'm just getting so much love. And, and then this, it was like a download, like on a computer, you download information, it's done. That was it, <clears throat> boom, it's all downloaded. I, I, I had no questions. I didn't ask. I didn't have to ask any. I didn't have any questions to ask. I didn't ask a single question. I mean, I just I was happy. So then this blazing light comes, and out of this blazing light, this angel of death, for a better word, uh, this feminine voice, beautiful, loving, feminine voice, goes, "Bill, you don't have to suffer anymore." You don't have to put up with the pain. You've done more than was asked. All you got to do is give up heart and go. I promise you bliss, love, a long rest, and, and, and a rainbow body. It's just, it's just it. It's just come with me. I, I promise you all that. I'm going, wow, okay, I'm ready to sign up for this, right? And then Gordoff, remember him, he's still there and he's going, his arms folded and he goes, Bill, don't give up heart. You could skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. He says, you got duty to do. You got God, you got Dharma. You got people that are waiting for your message, for my message, for Shiva's message, for love, for answers, something. You got duty that's undone. And I'm going, wait a minute. Okay, what do I get? He says, well, I'm going to promise you pain and suffering. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? He says, yes. He says, all your life when things happened to you that were really painful physically and stuff, you were blissed out always and it went away. You didn't have to take, take any pain pills. You're always, we're taking that away from you. We want you to have real pain and real suffering so in your life you could become an example to others when they have physical mm -hmm. pain. You can't just say, well, no. No. You got to be able to learn how to handle it yourself, so you can teach them to handle the pain. You'll have more reading, more <clears throat> meaning to them. And I go, wait a minute. Let me get this straight, Gornoff. She wants to give me bliss and peace and rainbows and love and and rest. And you want to give me more pain and suffering? Yeah, but it's your dharma, it's your duty. I go, holy cow. So I'm thinking she's got a heck of a deal going here. And then he does like this. And all around me, and the the air, the space around. It's all these faces, like Irene's. You know, all these faces of people. Like Irene. Like Irene's. <laughs> all these faces. <laughs> and and I was being shown all these people, huh. people in Wales, in England, Florida, California, Australia. It was just. People you were going to meet. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it was just going to be a smile I give them. Maybe it was somebody I was going to give hope to. Maybe somebody was going to hear my story. Maybe somebody would be inspired to do something to help somebody else. Different levels of help. Maybe they'd be inspired to seek God at a deeper level. Not about me, you know, and they'd be happy with me. Nothing to do with me. It's me moving them to their next level whatever their next level may be. And I was told, if you're not here, this will not be done. You know, then you delay in the process. Oh, jeez. So anyway, so finally, I'm going through this whole process, and all of a sudden, I'm feeling this poking and pulling, because obviously the anesthesia is wearing off, and in my physical body in India, is feeling this, like I got hands inside me, I'm going, whoa. And then all of a sudden, there's this chunk electric jolt that jump-started my heart. Boom! 
and all of a sudden now I'm feeling great pain and I'm I realize I'm in the body even though I got my eyes shut I know I'm on a steel cold metal table and there's people pushing shoving and wrapping wires around my ribs all kinds of stuff I go welcome back <laughs> welcome back to the world of pain and suffering and it was painful and uh Finally, they wheel me into the recovery room, and I'm in there a couple hours. I still got my eyes taped shut. They got tubes in me, tubes down my throat, tubes in my stomach, tubes in my neck. And all I keep thinking about, geez, all I got to do is say, I want to go, and I'm going to go, and this is all over, right? This is tempting. So finally, they take the tubes out and everything, and... <coughs> My wife looks down at me to see if I'm okay. And, and I don't know if she heard me or not, but in my mind I said, I love you. Because realize I had a tube down my throat that came out and it's all sore and everything. And so I don't know if I actually whispered I love you or if I actually said it or if it was all dental. But I think she got the drift. So another eight to ten days I'm in this process of getting worse. I didn't get better after the operation. I was getting worse every day. I had five blood transfusions. I, I, I was just, a chest cavity was filling up. I mean, everything was going bad. And one night, they uh, came to me, and it was like 10.30 at night, and they go, we're going to take you downstairs. I'm going to give you an MRI, and we're going to see what's, why you're filling up with fluids. Something, something's wrong, and, uh, and we got to do it right now. It's an emergency. I go, okay. All of a sudden, the bed, bedside phone and hospital room rings 10 30 at night right and i go oh, i got i gotta answer that and they go no 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 we got i said no i have to answer that so the nurse gave me the phone and i go hello and i sound like elmer fudd which i can't do but picture elmer fudd saying oh you know he talks. hello that's the way he was yeah like that exactly <laughs> and then i there you go there you go and then on the other end of the phone, I heard this, this Indian voice go, Bill, this is Gurnath from India. Like, and how many Gurnaths do I know, right? So, uh, the, and then the next thing out of his mouth was, don't give up heart. You can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. That's exactly what was told to me. And what was weird was, during the eight to 10 days after that surgery, every time I laid down and went to sleep or just was unconscious, I was back there on that hilltop having that same fight with the angel of death, with Gorinoff fighting over my, my decision. And that was going on for eight to 10 days. And the first thing out of his mouth after he introduced himself was, don't give up heart, cool. just give a few minutes. And then, he did something because he knows I'm a man of duty, you know, being a warrior, a military guy and everything. He knows I'm into duty. Loyalty is everything, right? So then he lays this trip on me. And he goes, I got about 110 people here right now at the ashram. I just said, I'm just sending them now to the, uh, the temple, the Shiva temple to pray for you. I told them I was going to heal you. You wouldn't want them to be disappointed, right? <laughs> So I mean, my God, if I if I die, I bring shame to my guru. He just told him he was going to heal me. He used the one thing he knew would work with me: duty and loyalty. I couldn't embarrass him. I couldn't embarrass him by saying, "I'm out of here." All the other thing was nice. I'm going to help people, all that, but it was ultimately not my wife, my children, my grandchildren. I'm, you know, it, it just wasn't. It was, my guru gave his word, and I didn't want to make him a liar. I said, okay. And then I told my wife, I said, I'm going to be out of the hospital in, in 36 hours. She goes, no way, you can't even, I mean, you're dying, right? You got all this blood. 36 hours later, I was out of the hospital. Of course, I I just asked the question, what do I got to do to get out of the hospital? So anyway, so why I'm in the hospital the last, the last day before I left? One of the other predictions in the Nadi was that Babaji would come and he would sprinkle water and oil on my spiritual eye, on my head, and he would bless me. 
sometime in the future, right? And I'm thinking, I was got kind of an odd prediction. I you know, okay, great. Why well, I was sitting in the hospital bed, all, all of a sudden I feel this energy around me, and it was like a like a, a crystal bowl turned upside down. You could see through an energy bowl, a, a dome of, of energy around my bed. And at the end of my bed stood the ever youthful, long haired Babaji with no shirt on but a pair of Levi's. <laughs> no. Levi's? Yeah, Levi's, some kind of pants. <laughs> It wasn't a loincloth, it was pants. Huh. And uh, and he's pouring oil and water on my head and chanting in some strange, and I'm just blissing out. I'm going, well, you know, if you're going to be delusional, this is a good delusion, right? This is great. You know, nobody's going to believe me. I don't even believe me. This is cool. Uh, this is good, right? Nobody sees it. So I'm home from the hospital the next day. My daughter comes over to see me and says, you know, David Ryan, he was our old neighbor. He was like 40 years old or something. He came by to visit you at the hospital the other day. And I said, no, I didn't. I didn't see him. He says, oh, yeah, he saw you. He, said, he came into the room and you had some crazy young Indian guy with a shirt off, long hair, was pouring stuff on your head and chanting this crazy stuff. And he didn't want to embarrass you, so he left. So I told her the story. And so, so there's a case where David came and he didn't believe in any of this stuff. But he was my validation for my experience. Otherwise, to this day, I would have thought I was just drugged up or something, right? But it gave me validation that he saw it. And when I was, when I got out of that dome, I looked around the hospital and there was a six minute time gap. I don't know why, how come, but I was six minutes into the future. I know that that doctor was going to walk by and six minutes later he did. That nurse was going to come in six minutes from now. I mean, I was in this thing for, for half a day where everything was, I was six minutes ahead. I knew it was a strange thing, never happened again, but it was just an odd thing, but it happened in correlation to all that. So that was the naughty reading, and that's how it tied together with some of that. And the naughty palm reading is about 90 some percent complete on all the predictions. So far, it's been. Like, for example, one of the predictions was you're going to have trouble with your skin, cause serious skin problems. Well, you know, you read my book, you know, that they cut most of my nose off and I had it rebuilt, you know, cancer. And it uh, looks pretty good, right? That's another great story, by the way. <laughs> That's quite a story. <clears throat> anyway. That's really good. Wait. Yeah. I can share that story. Well, let's let's do it. But let me ask you a few questions um, based in, upon uh, things I read in your book that, and some notes that Irene passed me here. I want to you know make sure to get in these questions. But we'll get into your nose story too because it's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> um, one thing you are a nose guy, huh? Yeah, I, I have quite a nose myself, actually. You know, here's the profile. Uh, I remember my father saying to me one time, "Where did you get that beak?" <laughs> Speaking of beaks, you like owls. We'll probably get into some owl stories, too. Um, okay, so there were a couple stories in one of your books where one was you were quite young, five or six years old, and these little beings came into your room. like They looked like little ETs or something, and you were terrified, and you were screaming bloody murder, and um, your father came in and told you to shut up, and then he left, and then your stepfather, and then you started screaming again, and your sister heard you from the other room, but she was afraid to do anything, so she stayed in bed, and I guess your father didn't hear you again after that. But that was one aspect of the story. And then another aspect was like, maybe five years later, you were camping in the backyard with a friend, and um, you, and around midnight, you saw this big, big light come down into a, an adjacent field, and next thing you knew, it was dawn. Like, uh, and you hadn't slept. It was like lost time. So I'm just wondering whether you think that uh, aliens have played a formative role in your life, that they somehow, you know, re realized that you have a certain destiny and tinkered with you in some way um, in order to somehow help you fulfill that destiny. Let's just call it Otherworldly beings. I mean, uh, let me just add one more thing when we talk about okay. aliens. I think if we, if we imagine, a, in my understanding and opinion, if we take a, a, a Venn di diagram, you know how the circles overlap like that, um, I think there are probably otherworldly beings, people from other 
places in the universe that, that have visited, that visit. And yeah, and then that's a second thing. There are beings who live right here on Earth as we do, but live in other dimensions, astral or celestial or whatever. And then there's probably an overlapping part of that Venn diagram where there are, so people from other universe, other galaxies or whatever, have the ability to travel interdimensionally um, and could appear on a subtle level where people couldn't even see them. But anyway, that was just a little, a little expression in my opinion. But um, what do you think about my question? Do, do you think that you well, were somehow primed to have this? Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because what's, okay, let's, let's talk about that experience. Uh, my brother who was in the same room slept through it all. Uh -huh, and you were screaming your head off. Mother and stepfather slept through the whole thing. My two sisters were awake and they were in a different room. So when I left out of my room, because they were all there, and I went in the other room, they came in there and then... Um, the little course, beans. Little beans. Uh, and the next thing we know, it was morning. And they're standing there by the window and kind of giving us one of those Vulcan signs or right. something, you know. <laughs> Live and, long and prosper. Well, yeah. yeah, it was like, 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 like loving parents or something. It wasn't... It wasn't they intimidating weren't malicious, so, yeah. to me. I wasn't intimidated at that point in time. My two sisters had a different experience, emotional experience from that. And neither one talked about it for over 50 years. I mean, we never had a conversation about that until I talked to my little sister, Marcia, like 50, it's happened like in 1950 or 51 or something. And we didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about it to her until 2000 something. And uh, but both of them, you know, they were afraid of the dark. They were afraid of things. Something happened. Maybe they were treated differently or, or whatever. And I didn't, yeah, you know, there's a part of me that says, well, you know, what? last year I went and got an MRI at the VA because they were checking my, my uh, uh, nerve, if I had nerve damage in my wrist because I was having some issues with the neck. And so they did an MRI and an X-ray on, on the wrist. And the guy goes, well, you got a piece of shrapnel in here from the war. I guess you never had taken out. And I said, no, there's no shrapnel there. I didn't get wounded there. And the guy shows me, he says, well, you got a metal object in there about so big. Wow. It's irregular shaped. How'd it get there? And I'm going. So. So you think it's an implant, an alien implant? Well, here's, I don't remember ever getting wounded there. Right. I mean, you'd know if something's. It's inside there, big, you know, piece of metal. I mean, it's going to bleed, right? So that was odd. That was just a little side note that uh, I didn't know when I wrote that book. But um, I think there are interdimensional beings. And Gurunov, he has an interesting quote I used in, in one of my books. I don't know what chapter. Well, I guess it was that chapter for that story. He says, there are no aliens. There's only ascended masters, uh, which I thought kind of fit. It fit what I was writing because it was a part of me that kind of believed they were imparting something to me. There was knowledge being exchanged. There was a gift. It wasn't just a take. And uh, I was able to handle whatever it was they were giving me. And I was very psychic. And of course, I had nosebleeds forever in you know, all my youth and everything. And, and I kept having future well, visitation is the only way I could say it because you know that feeling where you're in bed and all of a sudden, like you 500 pounds, you're back in your body again. I mean, every day was like that. It's like, return. I've been someplace, I'm coming back, right? And sometimes I wake up and there would be a hand on my on my hand. And then as soon as I focus, it'd be gone. So somebody was taking me on nightly journeys. Things were happening. Um, I hope that it was benevolent and uh, and beneficial. Uh, I, I'm the product of it, and I don't think I'm, I'm damaged. I don't feel like a victim of whatever it was. I think in, depending on your state of wakefulness uh, in uh, uh, various stages of spirituality, I don't know, but some people can't handle that kind of experience, and I, and I think it can break them uh, and, and cause them. But again... A normal person would have questions like, oh, this happened. Why? What, what was that? You know, 
and talk about it. No, no, okay, it happened. Great. I, these guys came in a story. But that's, I think one of the reasons I have unique experiences is I don't overthink them. I think too many people analyze things. And when you analyze things, you're working from the mind, the intellect, right. and not the heart. So I'm going, God shows me that? Great. I don't have to know why. Why did that thing levitate? Why did this happen? Why, you know, who cares? It happened. Great. I enjoyed it. Thank you for the gift. Great. Let's move on. I'm, I'm grateful for all that's happened to me. And that includes not only the supernatural mystical, but also the pain. For all that pain made me who I am today. And I'm forever grateful because it made me a, son. It made me a better father. You have to ask my kids how good a father I was. Maybe I would have been a lot worse. <laughs> but it made me a better grandfather. Maybe a better husband. Makes me a better friend. Well, if there's one thing I've learned through all this, and it's love, and the greatest way to show love is through loyalty. Loyalty to your family, to your tribe, to your unit, to your town, to your school, to your family, to your friends, to your guru, to your teacher, whatever it is. Be loyal to somebody or something. If you're not loyal to anything but materialism or power or money, then you, you've missed it. So, yeah, to answer your question, I, I really can't answer that. Uh, someday I'd like to sit down and, and just see what comes to me, and we can have a show and talk about that. But I, I think some people have a hard time accepting those stories. They can accept all this other, but they can't. And I'm saying, it's all the same God. It's all the same energy. It's all just a different experience. And God was in these things too. So, yeah, yeah. I think, I think in my case, they were here to teach me, to guide me, direct me, and they've been back. And I think they probably visit people in my family, uh, whether they've remembered or not. I don't know. I don't think I think these things are generational. I think they follow families. If I think they follow genetics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's another thing I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about. Uh, Irene wrote some notes here, and one of her notes was experiences of surrender to the universe, serendipity. And there was one you, you told. There's a lot of stories in your book where we don't possibly have, we won't have time to cover them all, but there was one that I thought was really sweet and I, I'd like you to tell it. And that was where you were at work. I used to work for the Postal Service and I guess you were working around the Sacramento area or something. And one day you just thought, I've got to go. And you just told your boss, I'm leaving. Not that you're quitting the job, but I'm leaving for the day. And he didn't question it. And no, middle of the day. Yeah. And so you, got, you went out and got in your car. It was pouring rain and kind of chilly. And you were walking, you were driving along, and you saw this kid by the side of the road who was soaking wet and bedraggled. And you didn't ordinarily pick up hitchhikers, but you decided to pick him up. And take the story from there. Okay. That whole week, that whole entire week, start off me going into a bookstore, and they had a random pile of books on sale. And then underneath at the bottom of that, I pulled out this book uh, on star signs that the lady's dead now is one of those women authors writes about star signs. And there was a quote, I just opened up at a random page and there was a quote in there about beware's who you talk to and how you treat people because there goes an angel, you know, once been known to you. Yeah. Was I quote, think it's something quote. in the Bible someplace. Yeah. It was a quote from the Bible. Yeah. And I read that. Oh, well, that's interesting. And then I went to my doctor's office. I'm waiting in the, in, in the lobby and I pick up a guidepost magazine. I just flip it at random and that same exact quote sitting there. I go, that's twice I got that quote this week. And then I kept having this feeling all week long. Somebody's waiting for you. You gotta help. You have to help. So when I went to work that day, I'm sitting here the whole day going, it was getting greater and greater and greater to reach the point where I couldn't say no to my intuition. I go, I gotta leave. And I couldn't offer an explanation to my boss, so I said, you know, I ain't gonna lie. I ain't gonna tell him why, I'm just gonna say I'm gonna go. And I said, I, I'm gonna go. Yeah, okay. Nobody asked me, I walk out of the building, worked on my desk, there's stuff going on, there's phones ringing. I just walk and leave, I said, that's it. But I didn't wanna lie. I mean, I do things, you know, you don't lie about doing something good, right? So I just, 
So I, I just left. And I wasn't sure why I was leaving. But I knew I had to leave right then and there. Got in my car, pick up, and I drove down the road and just just before, about seven miles from Elk Grove on the Highway 99, there's this tattered young guy. It turns out he's 22 years old. And uh, he's got one of those, what I call Scooby-Doo beard. You know, when a young guy tries to grow, he's got a hair here and a hair here. I mean, you know, he's got no real beard, right? And, and he's got a short sleeve shirt on, soaking wet, and he's got socks on his hands for gloves because he was cold and they're wet and he's got no no equipment no nothing he's just i said this crazy guy i've got to pick him up right so i back up after i pass the road i back up on the high shoulder of the road get him in the truck i said where are you going he goes, well, i'm going to texas i'm going yes yeah, 1800 miles away i said i tell you what i'm going down the road seven miles come with me okay so he starts telling me the story that he was camping alongside the road there in an empty lot the night before. He didn't have a tent. He had a sleep bag. But a big thunderstorm came in and rained, and a sleep bag got soaking wet. You know, and he just left it. So he had no no sleeping bag. He had no camping equipment. He had nothing. And that night, he was very despondent. He was very despondent. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So anyway, so he told me that, and he says that... Uh, he just left his grandmother's house where she just died and he'd been there for a couple of years. He was a foster kid and he was going to go to Texas, try to find his real dad because he had nobody else to go to and he had no money. I said, okay. So I found all that. He had the truck. I said, well, come on to my house. So I bring him in the house to the garage and he smells. I mean, he's been on the road for a couple of weeks. It's like he smells, he's dirty. I said, look, there's a shower, there's clean towel. I'll bring you down some clean stuff. Give me your stuff to wash, put it out here and clean up. You know, for, for, for me and you both, right? Anyway, so he goes in his shower and then laundry's clothes. And then I think, this guy's got nothing. So I take a back, I get a backpack. Okay, this guy's gonna be a bum on the road. He needs stuff, right? I get a backpack. I get half a part of a tent, a canvas thing that, you know, waterproof. I give him a fire starter, I give him a flashlight, I give him a sweatshirt, I give him underwear, t-shirts, socks, sweater, a couple of pairs of pants, a jacket, a uh, hat. I mean, everything you could think of. All kinds of items, you know, canteen. And uh, and he comes out and I gave him all his equipment. So you're going to need all this for on the road. And uh, and I, I didn't have any food now. So I basically fist of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I gave him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he's just looking at me, staring at me now. You know, my daughter's there, my wife's there, and he's staring at me. And I said, you got some stuff, you're wondering about some stuff, huh? And of course, he just kind of shook his head, right? And I said, well, when I give you this, and I reach into it, I pull out my junk drawer, and in the junk drawer is an open pack of sugarless gum. <laughs> it's got sticks of sugarless gum. Stupid thing, right? But I reach in there and I said, I'm going to give you this and when I give you this you will know why I'm giving it to you and you'll re and you remember and so I put it in his hand and he, and he looks at it and he starts crying just a pack of sugarless gum right and then he went through this whole story about the night before he's drenching he's cold he's chilling I mean he's shaking he was thinking about taking his life he was thinking about ending his life and then he said a man came to him who looked exactly like I did, dressed in the same exact clothes I was wearing right there in the kitchen, and had him that sugarless gum and told him, and he got to that part, and I stopped him, and God loves you. And then he really broke down because that's what the man in, the, in his vision told him, God loves you. And he was just all over himself, my daughter's going, how'd you know that? <laughs> What's this thing with the sugarless gum? What's the, you know? And I didn't know how I knew that. I mean, I didn't sit there and think, yeah, I was there last night for this guy, so this I'm going to do this whole act. No, I just did it. I just did it. And I just went down, grabbed the drum, he needs this, right? And I just said these things. So things come to me, I don't think about them. I want to show this, there's a law, but I don't intellectualize, well, why'd you tell me that? 
because sometimes I tell people something, well, why'd you tell me that? Well, a couple days later, they find out, oh, here's why. I don't analyze it. I don't own it. I don't own it. It's not mine. The universe, here it is. I just downloaded it. Here you go. Hmm. You know, how you saw me, whether that was me, whatever it was, was an out-of-body experience, was me in a second body, whatever it was. It doesn't matter. All that matters was he didn't commit suicide. And the next day, I not only resupply him with a shower and cleaning him up and give him clean clothes, I put some money in his backpack and gave him some food, put some food, canned food, and some bread and crackers and peanut butter and stuff. And I mean, I loaded him up so he could travel for a few days, right? And I prayed for that man for 20-something straight years. In fact, this last two weeks, for whatever reason, I started praying for him again because now it's, that was like 1980-something. You know, maybe 1990. Anyway, so it's got to be 25, 30 years. And he was 22, so he's in his 40s. So I'm thinking he's back on my prayer list. Hmm. So I visualize him. I call him in my mind because I can't remember his name, the hitchhiker. So I ask Babaji and God, Jesus, whatever, shine light on the hitchhiker. Hmm. That's like the story I got in there about the ebony angel, the black, the black young black lady that came, girl stayed with me, the 17-year-old, and she had a beautiful vision of Paramahansa Yogananda. I pray for her. So when people cross my path, I may do a small act or something. I may do something that looks like service, but I don't forget them. My prayer list, like last night, <laughs> the other night, I started going through my prayer list after meditation. It took me about an hour and a half to go through my prayer list in my mind, visualizing people and sending them light, visualizing them. Because on my prayer list, I, I not only have people like that, I have people that I wronged, people that have wronged me. Those two two groups need it the most. Sorry, tears coming down for some reason. <laughs> so praying for those that we come across in our life. You got a you got a hitchhiker on the road, you got a guy begging for money. If even if you don't want to give him money, give him love. Don't give him judgment. Give him love. Jesus, bless that man, bless that lady, bless that family. Because, you know, you can't give money to every beggar out there. And, I mean, let's get real. You can't. I mean, you, you can't. So you have to draw a line someplace. It's really hard to do sometimes. But you can give love. And you can give prayers. So that's kind of like how I serve. That's how I do things. And um, it's, it's, it's the core of who I am and what I do and why I continue to keep doing it. That's beautiful. Um, I haven't finished your earlier book about your experiences in Vietnam and everything, um, but one story, and, and maybe it'd be interesting for you to tell a story or two from that period, but one story I've heard you tell a number of times, which might be one of your favorites, which is I've heard you tell it so many times, is the time when you touched a helicopter and you kind of like realized what was going to happen to this helicopter in the next day. And, and, and there was that, and there was also the one about where you were flying in a helicopter as a gunner. And um, from the altitude you were flying at, you saw this uh, 30 or so people marching along a road who your commanding officer told you were Viet Cong and wanted you to shoot them. Um, and do you, do you feel like telling both of those stories? Or Absolutely. There, unless there's some I, I, other stories you'd it, like no, to tell. No, no, no. Absolutely, because... Let, let's just regress for a moment. I, I've been trying to, in my own way for the last couple of decades, reach out to the new age group, you know, and reach out to all these yogi guys and meditators. And and I keep getting thrown back for my veterans. I mean, the veterans invite me to stuff all the time. I'm always doing stuff. And I keep going, well, you know, I really want, you know. In the last year or two, I finally realized, you know, the universe is telling me something. There's a lot of people like me out there for the New Age community. They got all the people they need. But the veteran group is abandoned spiritually, most, most especially spiritually, because there's a whole group of, of New Agers out there, like, and I, I, I'm just throwing a blanket statement out here, uh, that think you can't be spiritual and be a warrior, or soldier. Mm -hmm. Even though history shows us St. Francis of Assisi was a warrior, St. Ignatius Loyola was a warrior. Arjuna Mahatma was a Gandhi warrior. was a, a, a sergeant major in the British Army in South Africa. Uh, 
I mean, the great ones, Krishna, Arjuna, they're yeah. in a big battle, right? Yeah. So that was their duty. So a part of me bleeds for them because I am them. And I'll share these experiences so you kind of know some of the stuff they go through. And I was able to survive Vietnam spiritually and emotionally and physically because when I went there, I was practicing meditator. I was into yoga. I was into Kriya yoga. I was into you know, the Kundalini energy. I was into all this stuff. I was into Paramahansa Yoga Nada. I was into a whole different aspect of reality. To me, it's all a dream. You know, it's just, it's all God. It's just a big play, right? People are getting killed. That's what everybody thinks. But in reality, God is killing God. God never dies. That's the reality. Uh, but that's a reality that nobody's ready to accept, and it's, it's hard. But I got veterans out there that are hurting. I'm starting to work with them now. In fact, I've been invited to be a keynote speaker uh, for International Association Near Death Studies. They have a, uh, their big international conference uh, in Pennsylvania, outside of Valley Forge. And uh, I've been blessed, literally blessed, to be able to do that. Somebody discovered me, found me, and asked me to go. And I am more than willing to go. I am whatever they want me to do, you know. It's for veterans. So let's talk about Vietnam. Vietnam was a war, like all wars. There's stuff that goes on. Warriors don't make war. They're pawns in the game of war. They don't make the decisions. That's politicians, that's generals, that's kings, Congress, whatever. Both sides... So you can't just say, well, I love my American vets, but the guys they're fighting are terrible too. Vets a vet, warrior's a warrior. Now, how you fight that war over there makes a difference. It's like the example I was given once upon a time by some Swami. He says, would you call it murder if a doctor made a mistake in the operation because he accidentally slipped and he cut some artery and the guy dies? Is he a murderer? Or he's just incompetent, but it's a lesser, you took somebody's life, but it's a lesser karma than somebody that, you know, stabbed the guy in the heart. Whole different thing, right? Or if a cop ends up shooting somebody that's getting ready to kill you, guy's got a knife getting ready to plunge you and the cop shoots the guy. Well, the cop shot that guy, he killed the guy, but is that murder? So there's all these levels of karma that we don't even know how to measure when it comes to taking of a life. And that's what happens when war. And I think your intentions in war are the difference. Are you intending to be in the light? Are you doing it for what's right? Are you doing it out of anger and hate and prejudice? Because I've seen guys in battle, oh, they hate these guys, you know, blah, 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 you know, and, they, and, and you see them, they, and some guys actually, they get off on this war, you know, just into and then I've seen some guys, they're only shooting back because they're trying to kill their buddy. So they want to save their buddy. They, they have a duty to protect the, the unit, right? So you got all these different levels, you know. Uh, so let's take the marching guys. Let's, let's take what I call the story about mutiny. Because believe it or not, I got decorated. I got all kinds of awards and everything. And the one time that I felt that I was the bravest took the greatest risk with my life and career I got nothing for except threatened to be locked up for the rest of my life or given a death sentence mutiny so here's how that day started off we had a a, a major graduate of West Point nice guy but he was into the rank and I'm the major and I'm in charge and and he doesn't realize that when you're in a helicopter there's only four four crew members Two are officers and two enlisted men. So you can't be on the officer and then half the crew is nothing, right? So it's like it, it, helicopter crews was family. It didn't matter about rank. But he, he came in new. He came in from Germany. He didn't know. And so his first mission out, and he's flying around, and, he, and he's trying to – he's not listening to his pilot. He's a commander, and he's trying to navigate, and the pilot's going, well, you – you follow the river, you do this. I, don't know. I got to get up higher so I can see these. So he wanted to fly up several, you know, a thousand feet or so or 800 feet up high enough 
where people could shoot at you. It was a very dangerous level. And we were warning him, but now he wouldn't listen to us. He'd let us know he's in he was in charge. Don't worry about it. He knew what he was doing. So we're flying over the, uh, where the Ho Chi Minh trails end in Vietnam. There's a big, tense, dense jungle. And it's what they call a free fire zone. In other words, there's not supposed to be people in this area. You know, you could, you could, you could actually, without permission, you could, you could fire people. But there were some friendly villages down there, so I was always aware there's friendly villages there. I mean, you don't fire somebody for no reason. But it, if they looked like there was a reason, you could fire. So he looks down there, and there's this column of 30 people in black pajamas, two by two, marching down this dirt road trail. And there's a guy in the front. And they look like they all got weapons on their shoulder. I mean, they really looked like weapons from high up where we were at. And he goes, Mac, you know, with McDonald. Hey, Mac, get on your M60. I want you, I want you to kill all those guys. Get those guys. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, Viet, Viet Cong. And I, I didn't move. I didn't do nothing. I mean, intuitively, I'm going, no, no. Something's right, right here. I said, sir, something's not right. It's not what you think. You question my order? I'm telling you to shoot. That's the enemy. I want you to shoot. And he gave me that order about five times. He finally says, this is a direct order. Failure to follow it. I'm charging you with mutiny. I'm going to have you court martial when we get back. You're going to be in Fort Leonard Worth the rest of your life. You're never going to see the light of day. I said, you do whatever you're going to do. How's that? That's bold, huh? You do whatever you're going to do, right? I ain't fire. That M60 machine gun fires a 7.62 millimeter round. It's about that big. 750 rounds a minute. I got a belt with about 3,000 rounds on it. I mean, I could have tore those guys up. I mean, it just would sit in ducks. So he turns the aircraft around the other side. He tells the gunner on the other side, and he goes, I can't remember his name, and he goes, hey, I'm giving you the same order. Shoot. And here's the part that just kind of made me a little scared a little bit because I'm now responsible for somebody else following my intuition, right? The guy goes, I've flown with McDonald for six months, and if he says something doesn't feel right, I listen. I refuse to fire. Now, that was a braver man than me because I had the feeling I was going with, but he was trusting me. And he already knows that if I'm facing mutiny charge, and he says, basically sign me up. I ain't shooting. So this guy's going crazy, you know. Finally, I go, sir, tell you what, you fly down, make a swoop down there, and if anybody looks like they're going to shoot at me, we'll both fire. Okay? Well, be prepared. <laughs> Maybe we'll get killed, you know. So he reluctantly took a pass, and when I went down there, it turned out to be 30-something children in black pajamas, and what they were carrying were hoes and rakes and shovels for the community garden. And the guy leading them was a Catholic priest in black robe. Now, you can imagine, killing the kids would have been bad enough, but killing a Catholic priest has got to be a cardinal sin, right? <laughs> I would have had a direct, you know, a direct letter coming from the Pope saying, hey, what's up? So I could feel the blood just going crazy with this guy because he just realized how close he came to committing a criminal act of war. I could have followed his orders and said, hey, I was following orders. Remember that there was a defense by some people? I'm just following orders. I don't believe in that. But I, I would have been skate. You know, no. You have to answer to something higher. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. Did I know it was 30 kids? No. Did I know it was civilians? No. I was prepared if it was been bad guys, I would have fired back. If they would have shot at me, I would have fired. But intuition said, no. I got that word, no. I listen. I don't say, well, how come? Or gee whiz, uh, this guy's going to court martial me if I don't do it. Can, can I get a maybe? You know, how about, you know, do I get another answer? And what, the only thing I regret to this day is I can't remember the name of the gunner because I think the guy deserves a medal. Mm -hmm. If I ever find out who it was, I think the guy deserves a silver star. I mean, that guy put his total trust in that. He knew the penalty. 
and he did that. Now think about that. Now that's the kind of moral issues that happen in war, and you can see how, had I done that, how that would have changed my life and the other door gunner and the other pilots and the commander, all of our lives would have been impacted forever. One has to learn to listen. Now the other story. Oh, before you finish, before you go to the yeah. other story, there was a nice conclusion to that story, which was the effect it had on that commander's personality oh. afterwards. Let's, let's talk about that. What's, you know, I could have gloated. I could have said all kinds of stuff. You know what I did? I was just gave him kindness and when he didn't turn, he became my best officer friend that I ever had. And every time he got on a ship with another crew chief, he introduced himself. He asked him where you're from, what he could do for him, you know, favors. He listened to his crew, became a great executive officer. I was so proud of him. That changed his day. That incident changed him to be a better person, less artocratic and in control and, you know, to be willing to listen to others. What a lesson. Had I not listened, he wouldn't have learned that lesson. He would have been, whew, what a lesson, the other lesson. So I act not on faith because faith is like, oh, I think something's going to happen. It's a belief, a wannabe belief. That's faith. You want to believe it. I act on a knowing, and there's a difference. I know the sun will come up tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. I know, and when I get a I know feeling, I don't question it. Now, an intellectual person, I think that's why me being a little on the dumb side, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that sharp. I'm not the sharpest pencil in the thing, you know. I, you know, I, I struggled with geometry, you know. And I, Okay, there's sharper people out there. But they think about things. They analyze things. They're using the mind. Anybody will tell you, yeah, you know, Bill, he's out of his mind. He never uses his mind. He's out of his mind. Well, that's it. I'm really out of my mind. I don't use it. <laughs> I think, I feel, I react, I speak all from the heart center. And when I start something like this interview, I had nothing prepared. I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't even know where I'm going to go in the next sentence. I open my mouth and I just rely on the universe filling in thoughts. There's a part of me that when I'm doing something like this, will sit. I'm watching myself up here once in a while, I'll flash, I'm up here and I'm going, well, that's interesting how you answered that, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go with this question. I mean, I'm actually watching now. I'm, like, there's two of me watching this. Yeah, I get that on this side, too. So, all right. So let's go back to some of the other incidents. Because, because I really want to talk about warriors. Because when I give you these experiences with what you call, uh, there's a new term out there, maybe not new to you, but for, in the warrior community, in the Vietnam community, and veterans, stuff called spiritual uh, transforming experience, so a spiritual transformational experience, you know, because you got like near death experience, and now you can have something like that, but you don't have to die. You're having the same kind of experiences, but otherworldly. And uh, I had a lot of those. This particular one, which I'll tell you about, by the, when I told the, the aircraft story when I was going to die. What's good about this story is this still has a life, because. I was investigated by the CIA when I reported this and put under the hot seat and they, they, you know, for a couple of days they wanted me to change my story about it. And then they told me, we're watching you because you think you did something because nobody can know all this stuff. And then a few years back, I'm talking just a few years ago, I get a call from Langley, Virginia. That's what my phone says. It said, Langley, Virginia. When the heck's calling me from Langley, Virginia on my phone? It was a CIA contractor who had like a $28 million budget or some huge amount. And he had my files. And the guy says, I got your files here. I go, what files? Well, we can't talk about it. I said, you mean the CIA has a file on me? He goes, yeah, but you can't get a copy. I go, why can't you get a copy? It's me. He said, well, you're gonna get all this, everything be redacted but your name. I go, what does it say? He said, I can't tell you. He says, well, however, I want this, I want this information and how you did this and how you knew that. He was trying to reproduce it electronically with electronics and money, and they thought they could engineer what happened. So let me tell you what happened, and and you can see why they didn't 
want to hear what I wanted to say about it. Because I'm telling the guy, well, you got to learn some kind of kundalini energy rising uh, uh, yoga, you know, you know, some kind of meditation. I didn't want to hear that. Anyway, so I'm sitting around one day, and my aircraft was taken in and being fixed, so I didn't have uh, uh, an aircraft. I had the, the day off. But they came to me and they said, hey, would you, would you fly this aircraft tomorrow? We don't have enough crew chiefs and, you know. And I said, well, okay, let me go take a look at it. I'll do a pre-flight on it. And when I went over to do the pre-flight, when I touched it, the skin of the aircraft, Huey helicopter, looks like a giant tadpole. You know, this, I touched it and it was like, just like that. It wasn't like this whole drawn out several minutes. It was like instant download. I had, I'm watching this helicopter fall apart in the air. I see the rotor going crazy. I see it spinning, hitting a jungle, spinning around, bursting into flames. And I see bodies falling out on fire all over the place. I see everybody being killed. I feel the heat. I feel the pain of the burns. I feel the spirits leaving the body. All just like that. It takes me longer to tell you. I mean, it was instantaneous. So I go, wow, man. So I wrote up the aircraft. Now, normally the crew chief writes up the aircraft and he signs it off, says, ready to fly. If there's something wrong, you put a red X in it and you explain what's wrong and then you fix it. Of course, he comes out and fixes it. I put a big red X in there and I just put something wrong with the aircraft. It's going to crash and burn. <laughs> it's like, that's not a military thing you do, right? They go, what is this? What are you I said, I ain't signing off on this. Something's wrong. Something's wrong with the rotor, the rotor head, something. Something's going to happen. This thing's going to crash and burn. So they sent out a whole team of mechanics and special people. And, and I said, you guys sign it off. Because they wanted me. I said, I ain't signing it off. I'm saying it's a red X. I'm saying it's going to crash and burn. So all these guys signed it off, and yeah, they all checked. It. Yeah, yeah, we think it's good. And then I, I told the CEO, I said, I ain't flying it tomorrow. Well, we got you scheduled to fly. You're on flight status. You said you'd fly it. You're flying. I said, sue me. <laughs> do whatever you got to do, right? Well, you're going to be you're going to be punished. I mean, you, this this is disobeying. Back to this disobeying direct orders. I had a lot of that over there. Disobeying direct orders. I said, okay, I tell you what. You can put me on any aircraft tomorrow. I ain't going on that, and neither should you let anyone else fly on that. And of course, the CEO tells me I'm in charge. You're not. You're E5. I'm. I'm a. I'm a major. You know. I said okay. So I go back to my bungalow hooch, in a little hut. There was like 20 of us in there or so, and there was a new guy there, a guy named uh, Al Durrell. And he had a real easy job in Saigon. He was actually, back in the old computer days, that guys feed IBM cards in and, you know, the punch cards and all that. He had that kind of job in Saigon, the air-conditioned building, ate in a good restaurant, you know, had a hotel room instead of a billet. I mean, but there was a part of him that says, this ain't right. I'm in Vietnam. I want to fight. So he volunteered from his easy job to become a door gunner on a Huey, which is like, life expectancy of door gunners <laughs> you know I, I'm, I'm sitting behind a gun I know it's it's not good I mean there's nothing to hide behind and you're sitting on a canvas seat I mean there's nothing to stop anything so he volunteered and he showed up at our unit that day and he says I was told he just transferred in and he was gonna be a door gunner so they brought me over to introduce him and said you know hey Mac this is uh, Al and as soon as I shook his hand I got that same whole vision. I just like, wow. And I, I go, you're a dead man walking. That's what I say now. I didn't know that term there. So, I, But basically it was something like, you're gonna die tomorrow or something, don't go out. So I told him, I said, whatever they do tomorrow, don't go flying and don't go flying on that aircraft. So I told him a number and everything. And he goes, I'm not even on flight status. I don't have any flight equipment. I said, if they ask you to fly on that tomorrow, don't go because you're never coming back and i started tears started rolling down my face i was just people lost man 
Max better too long in country, man. He's cracking up, right? But I was serious. And everybody kind of gave me that, you know, you know, Max, Max Bender too long stuff. I mean, crazy guy, right? So, um, so I went back to my bunk and I just, I knew, I knew, I didn't know what to tell the guy. I knew. And when I got up in the morning, because I was going to fly on another aircraft, because I showed the CEO, I'll fly on anything. So I took a real dangerous mission. I flew on another aircraft. And I walked by the other aircraft and it was empty. And I went back and made sure the guy knows. It's empty. It ain't going anywhere. It's not on flight status. Don't go, right? And I left. We come back in the afternoon. The helicopter's not there. Yeah, there's a guy. So I go into the CEO's office. <laughs> I go, how dare you send that aircraft out there in a mission? Well, how dare you question what I do with my helicopters? Who in the hell do you think you are, right? So it was like, and, I mean, this is totally out of protocol in the military. I'm an enlisted man, right? So I'm telling him, I said, you just killed all those people you sent out there. Oh, no, 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 it's just late. I said, how late is it? Well, it's two hours. I said, it only it only can fly for about two or three hours with fuel. If it's been flying all day and it's two hours late, it's out of it's out of fuel, wherever it's at, right? Well, okay, we'll have to go out and look for it. So uh, he says, why don't you volunteer to come along on this since you seem to know everything, right? So... We get out there, we, we get up in the air, and the pilot goes, being a smart ass, he goes, okay, Mac, where's that? Which way should we go? And I just point off in some direction on the compass map, and they all look at each other like they had no clue where it's at either. So they say, okay, we'll fly that way. We're flying about 20 minutes to pursue. We see this glow of the jungle. It's just getting dark now. And there's this forest fire. And in the middle of this forest fire, as we circle around, there's the remains of the helicopter torn in pieces. And there's all these bodies of all these guys all burned up. I volunteered to go down a rope and check it out. And they go, no, 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 no. We don't know what's down there, right? You know, they didn't want to hang around. If, I'm, if I was getting shot at, they would have left, I think. So we came back. Nobody said a word to me. Nobody talked to me. But the equivalent of the NCIS guys, I can't remember what the Army version of that. There's an Army version of the, of the uh, NCIS. Uh, they got some kind of initials. And uh, they came and they quizzed me and they put me in a, under, under a light, 100 lot bulb, in a tent, hot tent, on a stool for all day, a couple days, Question me, how did you know that airplane was going to crash? You must have did something to make it crash. You, you killed those guys. We're going to prove it. We're watching you for the rest of your life. And I told him, I said, well, something's wrong with the rotor or the rotor head. I know it. I know it. How could you know that? I said, I saw the vision. And that was the end of that story. So I thought, yeah, sure, these guys. So I thought, you know, weeks went by, and they, and they basically told everybody, yeah, he's killed him. We don't know how he did it, but he's killed him. Um, and nobody told me until when I wrote the book. Just before I wrote the book, one of the guys from my unit, one of my pilots went on the National Archives and looked up the crash investigation. Three weeks after that investigation, there was a report that said the rotor head failed. There was a, a bolt, a nut up there that failed and caused the thing to freeze up and it crashed. So they knew within three weeks that it wasn't my fault and it was exactly what I told them it was. And even me telling them that they couldn't find what was wrong with it. So for all those 40, 50 years, I had that, are they watching me? Are they waiting for me? What's going on, right? And then I got the call from the CIA. I said, those turkeys, they believed me the whole time. Not only did they have that story, but they had all the rest of my stories that I shared in my unit. They had a whole file on me. Somebody was watching and listening, and they were recording all my stuff. And apparently I'm not that hard to find on the internet because this guy was able to find me. I mean, how many Bill McDonald's there are, but apparently... They found me, so it was uh, interesting. So that gets back to what I'm talking about with veterans. There are veterans out there that had experiences. You can't share them with the military official ranks. It's they're gonna label you as crazy. If you got a secret of clearance, you don't anymore. Uh, I knew an officer. He's dead now. Uh, Neil Levin, and he was a 
he was one of the first uh, guys to graduate from that flight school thing. Was that Top Flight Academy, whatever it was? Anyway, he was a top flight guy, whatever the name of that is. But he was a Navy guy, and he was, you know, he was like a great fighter pilot. And he was in Vietnam flying over an area, and he's getting shot down, and he's getting ready to eject. And he looks over, and on his wing sits this young, beautiful young girl, Angel, smiling at him. And he goes, wow, this is weird. It's, it's crazy. I'm getting ready to be shot down. So he just kind of kept that story to himself. When I talk to him 40-something years later, he tells me, he says, let me tell you where that went. And he shows me a picture of his granddaughter. Granddaughter. He says, this is the angel that's on the wing. And I know that because she came to me one day and said, hey, Grandpa, you remember when I was on your on your uh, fighter jet sitting on the wing? And you crashed? I was looking after you, Grandpa. So, but he couldn't tell anybody. And then, just before he got shot down, him and his wingman were flying over just outside of Hanoi when they encountered a UFO, the real kind, flying, odd-shaped thing, flying, <laughs> zipping around flying all around him and so he chased it he chased it all the way to cambodia he calls into the aircraft carrier and says hey we're chasing this bogey this uh a ufo unidentified and the guy in the tower goes uh, colonel are you sure you want to report this ask him four times to finally get the idea oh okay we're chasing a bogey we don't know if it's a mig or what okay you're chasing a bogey all right couldn't catch it but things all but he saw it, he swear to God, he saw it. Another guy, a friend of mine from Self-Realization Fellowship, uh, his name is Lee. And this incident uh, he shared with me when we were at uh, uh, Hidden Valley Ashram for uh, the men's retreat there in Self-Realization Fellowship down by San Diego. We were out one day meditating and hiking. And, and he told me that they were sitting around, he was in the Ninth Infantry, I believe, in a big circle at night. Now, you don't know anything about about this. Most people don't know that are civilians. But when he was camping at night, they'd make a circle. Everybody facing outward in a circle. And so every other guy was asleep. And then a couple hours later, you wake up the other guy. So somebody's awake all night long. So all of a sudden, he's supposed to be sleeping, and it's so quiet. He said it was so quiet, he could hear a trail of ants crawling next to his head. He could hear the ants moving sand. And he wakes up and he looks around and all these guys are looking up at the sky. Every other guy is looking up at the sky. And they're all dazed, right? So he asks them what happened. And these guys go, there was an aircraft ahead of us that was spinning with lights and flashing. It was only about 100 feet up and was there for a long time. He goes, yeah, sure. So he goes to the other, other sides of the circle. They all have the same story. So what was that? You know? So... I've heard many stories like this. I've heard stories of near-death experiences in Vietnam. I've heard spiritual other experiences. I've had many more that are in my book. So people have to realize that where life places you, it's all God's territory. Miracles, the miraculous, the mystical, love happens even in battle. And it's all where the heart is. So if you go into real war and battle, whether it's with another person or argument or whatever, wherever you're at, whatever your battle is, if your heart is focused on love, that's all that counts. So there are no battlefields that are going to harm you. Nice. But, uh, I, I, I do say, I don't know if you got some of the questions, but I, just for a minute in case we run out, I have a program uh, organization called Spiritual Warrior Ministries. It's it's a, a organization I put together. It's a loose affiliation. I've got chaplains from all kinds of organizations. I've got ministers from different, you know, actual ministers, reverends. I got uh, guys that are, aren't ordained at all. They just want to be a chaplain. I make them a chaplain. Great, go. God's with you. Anyway. 
the basic concept is no dogma. You can't preach dogma. They don't try to change anybody's beliefs. Wherever they're at, you accept them at that, give them spiritual counseling. End of story. Help veterans. Help their family. Don't charge for your service. If somebody wants to donate to help you with it, great. But don't ask. So that organization, uh, which I'm expanding into Europe, into Russia, hopefully, uh, and around the world, uh, is there to give free, free help and, and uh, administer support. It's best if I can get veterans, at least people that are interested in helping veterans. And we're teaching yoga, we're teaching meditation. We got one guy now that I just ran into that's speaking at IAM's conference. Uh, he lives in Southern California. And he taught TM meditation to West Point and to the Air Force Academy, I believe. And he went overseas in the war college. That was way back. I might know so, him. So you might know him. Yeah. So, uh, that's where things are heading. So it's interesting that I've been invited to IAMS this conference this year because this is the one year they're going to kind of bring veterans issues in. And it's kind of been a burning thing in the back, you know, the back burners. And now it's going to get a little light of day. And I'm, and I'm happy to be a part of that. And again, I am not the message. I'm only one of the many messengers out there. But we have to we have to make peace. And this is this is about everybody. It's about the vet, the non-vet, the child, the old guy, the crazy, the sick, the lame, the lazy. It's all the same. It's all your brother and your sister. Yes, I really believe we're our brother's keeper because basically they are a brother, we're their brother, our sister. I mean it's one. How can you separate? It's my left I'm only gonna do good things with this left hand, but this right hand I'm gonna cut it off because I don't like it. It's all the same body of God. Nice. You got some questions? I know. Yeah, actually, um, Irene sent me a, a question a little, a couple hours ago, actually. Um, she said, and this might. That's too No, this will be fine. And I think this will lead into. We're still going to talk about your nose if you feel, if you have the time. Yep. We can yep. go a little long. Um, she, here's what she wrote She said, Your upbringing had some hard knocks in terms of lack of love and support from your family and yet that helped you develop your experience of quote someone out there loves me end quote it helped you it helped to develop your love for god and surrender to the universe you had so many experiences of great support and love in spite of what you went through or possibly because of it could you elaborate on that and maybe as you elaborate you could somehow um segue into your into your nose <laughs> <laughs> we, we could do that, as I like people to know while you were reading that. Um, that was my segue. Here's, here's the deal. It's, and this is so cliche that I hate to say it, but it's not what happens to you. It's how you handle it. And that's been my philosophy ever since, ever since the beginning. It's, it's never about being a victim. I am not a victim. People read my book, they go, oh, my God, you had more stuff to happen to you than to me, and how could you not get mad, and your parents did this and that. I'm going, everybody was following their own battle plan, their own dharma. We don't know if what they were doing was an intended thing. I needed to have that for whatever it caused me to reflect on or made me a better, more spiritual, active person. I mean, whatever it was, it was a catalyst for who I am today. So therefore, no one should be getting down on a victim. If, you know, if you got things happening to you in your life, you know, you, you're, I mean, I, I deal with, I'm dealing with a couple of abused women right now that, you know, I mean, they just, some really horrific stories. And uh, at some point in time, it's not the time now, because I can't tell them the time to move on. They have to, they have to deal with that hurt first. People have to be ready to move on. But at some point in time, you got to go, you know, it was what it was, but it's not who I choose to be now. Right now, I'm not a victim. Right now, nobody's doing anything to me. Right now, I haven't been abused. Right now, I haven't been whatever it is. Because everybody has something that happens. Our level of pain is different. It's for example, if me and you are in the hospital, and you've never been in the hospital, so you probably don't know, but they give you this little chart. Show us your pain level, one through ten, right? And I always laugh because... Mine's going to be a one or two, even if I've been ripped open. It's like I have, I've had my teeth drilled 
drill down to the nerve, no medic, no, no, no Novocaine, no, just, I don't want no shots, just drill it down, fill it. And the dentist is going, I'm, I'm just, I do a little hong saw technique, I sit there, okay, drill it down, boom. So pain level is different to everybody. There's somebody who has something, you, you would say, that's nothing, man, that's an ache. And this guy, oh, it's number 10, I better have some, I better have some oxy, man, I got number 10 pain, you know. So life is like that. If you choose to focus on the pain, the pain becomes number 10 for you. I have been trying to teach veterans, and I've, I've had some guys call me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, somebody's wife would say, this guy's getting ready to kill himself, he can't take the pain anymore. He, you know, he's a burn victim, he's got burns all over, he's lost his arm. He says, all right, let's, let's put him on the phone. And then I, I'll go through a technique, you know, where you have to take the pain and make it elevator music. The music is still there in the elevator. You, you, you still got, you know, whoever's singing in the background, but you don't hear it. It's, it fades. So you don't make the pain vanish, but it's not the forefront of your mind. It's not in your thoughts. And you can do that with various mantras, whether it's just, I love you, Jesus, or whatever. And, and there's ways to refocalize that. Anyway, so I, I'm trying to teach people that. Because pain, as Buddha learned a long time ago, is one of the great motivators. So pain is not an enemy. Suffering is. But pain? Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's talk about pain. Before you get into, yeah, I, just, I had the same question a little while ago towards yeah. the beginning when you were talking about pain versus suffering. And um, it sounds very nice to say, yeah, if you could just sort of regard pain as pain and and not allow it to cause you to suffer, that's great. But um, I wonder, I mean, some people undergo such horrific things. Do people, do that many people really have the capacity, you know, if they're no. being tortured no. or, or no, no. serious burn problems? I mean, it's, 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 it sounds glib to just say, oh, it's just pain, don't let it cause suffering. Now, my advice, because i got a couple people I'm talking about right now, I, I don't do marijuana, never done it. All right, I'm not into it. But I'm telling people, if your pain is that bad, use marijuana. I don't want people taking oxy. I mean, there's a lot of drugs that veterans are taking to make them suicidal. But there's some there's some safer stuff out there. Uh, meditation, all kinds of things. And if you can't, if you're dying and you got bone cancer, and you, you know, it's just totally, I mean, it's horrific pain, bone cancer, and you're dying, let the doctor drug you up. Be comfortable. There's no sin, you know. What do you worry about getting hooked on something? You're getting ready to leave in a few weeks. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm telling people, don't just focus on the pain. Complain, moan, and groan, and that's not just physical pain, but that's also life stuff. Because people get down, the moan and groan and bitch about things that happened to them. And I listen to this person, I listen to this woman tell me all this stuff that's happening. Oh my God, it's really terrible. She's telling me, really, it's, it's like feels like it happened yesterday. But when that happened, oh, 37 years ago. And she's talking about it. It just happened. It's still fresh. And every time she tells us that story about all these painful experiences, it's like redoing it in her mind. It's like she suffered it. She's choosing to suffer it again and again and again. Whether it was abuse or whatever, she's being abused again and again and again instead of saying, once is enough. I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of suffering again for it. Once was enough. Let's move on. But you can't tell people that because... I couldn't tell a general audience that I am in this video, but I, I, I have to put quotes around that and say, one on one, I got to tell, I got to feel people out. Some people don't have the strength, so I tell people, mourn as long as you have to mourn for death. You know, deal with this thing as long as you have to deal with it. You'll feel what's right time for you. There is no fixed all time schedule that you're supposed to get over abuse or whatever it is, right? So. Yeah, it's just uh, you know, Christianity makes Christianity makes such a big deal out of how how much Christ supposedly suffered, and uh, Maharishi Maharishi Yogi used to say Christ never suffered. You know, he suffering people from their perspective saw him as suffering, but from his subjective perspective, given the, the status of his consciousness, he may have experienced pain, but it wasn't suffering. You can have pain and be in bliss. Yeah, I'm just telling you that. Been there. So let's talk about 
your nose. The rebuilding, the rebuilding of the nose. The schnoz. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I had, you know, from my exposure, exposure to Agent Orange, my time as a professional lifeguard, my time as a professional scuba instructor, uh, swim team, uh, long distance swimmer, all kinds of stuff, sunshine, surfer, all that stuff. I had pretty bad skin cancer. In fact, I, I still have, I just had a treatment uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So I still had some taken off. So I've been doing this since 1979. You know, the easy ones you burn off, you know, little, uh, but I've had some taken off. I've had one in the cheek taken off that was the size of a golf ball, huge sucker. I mean, it was just huge. Uh, it took two. It took an hour to sew it back. You know the hole up. Anyway, so I've had some really major stuff, and so my naughty says you'll have some real bad skin problems. Well, they weren't underestimated. So I go to the doctor, dermatologist, and I'm going to go on. I said, you know, this nose ain't getting any better. It looks like, and it was right up in the tear duct. Tear duct was looking funny. It was right next to the tear duct. And they said, well, let me let's take a sample. So they take a scalpel. And they're cutting this right next to your tear duct, of course, which is really fun. And uh, and they send it to the lab, and it comes back. You, you, it's it's really bad cancer. You, we got to cut off lots of flesh, anything that touched or close to it, right? So I go in there, and I wasn't sure what they were really going to do because, uh, you know, it was – went. they sent me to this first doctor, and, uh, and I go in there, and he's a uh, – Plastic surgeon. I don't know why they sent me to a plastic surgeon. Because I got a postcard that says, you got this doctor appointment here, and then you got this doctor appointment, you got this doctor appointment. So I, they didn't tell me why. So I go to the first doctor, and he goes, he has no bedside manner, none. But apparently he was really good at what he does. And he come in there, and he looks at this, and he goes, sit down. Let me look at your nose and your eye. And this guy was also an eye surgeon. And he says, he says I don't know. He says, I might have to. I might have to amputate, remove your eye. I might have to cut cancer out behind your eye. I mean, that's just the conversation starts off. There's no warm-up. How are you? What do you do for a living? You know, well, this thing could be, you know, it was just, no, I'm gonna, probably going to have to do this. He says, I'm looking at your lips. Probably have to cut your lips off. Probably have to cut both ears off. Going to have to cut your eyelids off. And for sure, your nose. And I'm not too sure about parts of your forehead. And I'm just sitting there going, Huh? What? I went in not having any idea. I thought the guy was going to, you know, spray a little liquid nitrogen, cut some tab off or something, you know. He's going, major, major surgery. So I'm going, wow, right? So so uh, I'm stunned. And I have to admit, I'm, I usually got my act together. But I was stunned because it was just like, boom. And it was like five minutes. And he goes, yeah, go see this guy. Go see this guy tomorrow. He's going to cut off your nose or whatever else needs to be cut off. Yeah, I was about to cut. If he has to cut your ears, whatever. But you'll find out tomorrow. Just go in there or in the morning. And then you got to go the next day to plastic surgery to see what they can fix. It may take multiple surgeries. I'll be there for that. And then he walks away. Nobody is holding my hand. Nobody was saying, golly gee, Bill, this sounds like it's pretty terrible. And it wasn't the thought of pain. This is going to sound terrible. But it was vanity. I'm thinking, what am I going to look like with no lips, no ears, no nose, no eyelids? You know, and a tear duct gone. Uh, that was my thought. I don't know if a normal person would think like that, but I'm thinking, because if you get a pimple on your nose, you kind of go in the, you know, you want to cover it up, right? So I left her and I go sit in my truck. And I call up Gronoff and I get his answering machine. He was in America. I get his answering machine on his smartphone of all things. Yeah, he's got a, got a smartphone, an iPhone, and uh, I go going off. I'm not asking for I'm not asking for anything, not asking for a healing. I never asked for a healing. I'm not asking for a healing. I'm just asking for courage, strength, uh, and wisdom to handle this. That's all. And then I hung up. And then I sat there because it was a party. It was still kind of. I was actually a little bit shaky. I was like, wow, that's asking a lot, man. I haven't even told my wife yet. I mean, because that's like changing your whole life, right? Because I think I'm kind of okay looking. I'm, you know, I'm not average Joe, but I would have been a monster in my mind, you know, missing parts. 
Um, and then I just said, you know, I can handle this. Whatever it is, it's a test. I can handle it. I can handle it. So within about 90 minutes of me self-talking to myself saying, I'm going to learn something from this. And if, if it messes up, and I, don't, I will learn how, these, how people feel when they're like that. I'll be able to, to minister people like that. I'll be sympathetic and empathetic. And heck, this is funny. I could tell people how I lost my face, you know, <laughs> how I lost face with it. I mean, I'll find humor in this. I will make it work. It's not the end of the world. Damn it, there's an inspirational story coming from this. It's going to happen. Okay, let's do it. Because here's the way I, I live my life. So I watched, I watched Gurnoff, and everybody comes to him for advice. And you know, if you really narrow down what he tells people, they can come to him for marriage, work, health. He always tells them two things. It's your karma, <laughs> deal with it, or do more do more meditation, or do more Kriya Yoga. So I think to myself, it's, it's, your, it's your karma. Embrace it. Embrace whatever comes to you. That's it. It's given to you. Embrace it. Love it. Love it. It's a gift. Don't know what it's going to be, but it's a gift. Take it. So that was my attitude. It was, I'm going to embrace it. I'm, I'm dealing with it, right? So I tell my wife, and i got to be honest, I, my wife was kind of like very, very quiet. We didn't have much of a conversation. I mean, it had to be hard on her. And this is somebody that she apparently likes. She's been married to me almost 50 years. So she's put up with a lot. And she knows I'm going to go through some pain some great pain the next day. And uh, so I had, that night, I go to sleep. And uh, and, I, and I wake up the next day, and I go, she drops me off. I said, don't hang around, because this is going to be an all, all morning, all day thing. What they do is, they cut so much, they, they shoot you, they were shooting injections behind my eyeballs, in my nose, down into my sinuses, the, the needle was actually was in my throat. I could feel it from up the eyeball. It was down because I feel the drops of the stuff. And they would numb everything up, and then they would cut, and then they would burn it to seal it, and then they would throw general gauze over it, and then they'd have you go sit in the waiting room for an hour while it was sent to a lab. And then when they saw how much cancer was there, then they come back, and you kept going through this process. And then you got the shots all over again. So you got to sit there in the lobby and think about going back in and being cut again and getting more cut and more shots all around the eyeball and behind it. That happened multiple times, right? So, uh, and while they're cutting, I feel the blood just pouring down my face and, and everything else. And, and then this, uh, I'm going to show you I'm not perfect. I'm going to throw this part of the story in. There's an evil, evil person in me. There was this young lady come in. She had to be about 20 years old. And she had four of her friends come in, holding her up and everything. And she was, she had a mole that was going to be taken off. A little tiny mole. I couldn't even see it. And uh, they were going to cut it off. And, you know, she was, and I said, well, don't worry about it. It's not that big. I said, yeah, I had all these bandages on my feet. I said, look, I said, it's not a big deal. I'm going, don't you talk to me, you chauvinist. I'm a woman. I can handle this. I don't need your chauvinist, uh, uh, you know, trite. And I'm going, oh, okay, fine. So I just sat back. I'm an old guy trying to help her out, right? So then the nurse calls her in. She collapses. And they drag her in. Her feet are dragging. And she starts screaming and crying. Ah! And I can hear her back there in the treatment room. And she's crying and screaming and crying and screaming for a half hour. She comes out. She's got a, a little tiny Band-Aid here. And they're done with her. And I'm going. She wouldn't look me in the eye. But here's the evil part. Inside, I was laughing. I'm sorry. All those people that love me think I'm a good guy. But inside, it was like, yeah, babe. All right. You didn't need my advice. You, Miss Male Chauvin is telling you, you know, okay, great. How'd it feel? Anyway, that was terrible. I felt bad. But I didn't at the same time. It was like, so I go back there. And I told the doctor, I said, I told him the story. He starts laughing. And he goes, yeah, we had to, we had to hold her down. It took everybody to hold her down. He says, all I did was I just took a couple layers of skin off. She was like crazy insane. Anyway, so then he starts giving the shots. He says, and he's talking to me, and he's just cutting away. He says, you know what? He says, I'm cutting a lot off here, you know. 
I said, well, I'd like to see what it looks like. He had a mirror, and he says, no, I'm not going to let you look. He says, I'm going to take a picture for the the plastic surgeon. So he took a picture, and he says, I'll let you kind of give you a flash glance. I don't want you to look at it. He said, it'll make you sick. I said, well, what's going to happen tomorrow? Because he finally finished up. He said, well, tomorrow, he says, uh, the normal procedure is he's going to cut your forehead in a triangle big thing here and it comes down to the top of your nose and then he'll fold that over upside down and then they will sew that on top of your nose that will be your new nose will be your forehead and then your forehead's going to have no skin it's going to be all messed up and we'll have to stitch that and you're going to need about five plastic surgeries to make this that better and then meanwhile you'll have a hump in the nose that'll grow where the skin is hanging there then i'll have to have surgery on that and reduce that but it'll always look like it's kind of folded over it's, he says but it covers the hole and I said, whatever. Okay. I'm prepared for whatever. And he says, okay. He says, now, when you leave here, I said, all this all this local stuff is going to wear off. You're going to be in the greatest pain of your life when you leave here. He says, it's going to feel like your face has been on a barbecue pit. He says, this, he says, I've been burning everything. And I said, I don't need anything. He says, no, no, no. So he gives me 500, 100 tablets of 500 mgs of oxy. I didn't know what it was, right? Okay. I said, I'm never going to use it. She said, no, take it. So I get home, and my wife's looking at me, and she looks at the pills. She says, you never take pills. I said, I know. You're going to take them? I said, nah. Real men, real men wear black, and they don't need pain pills. Pretty soon, that pain was so great. Greatest, I mean, it was screaming. And I said, well, you know, maybe I'll take a half a pill. And I put the half a pill in my mouth. But as I did so, I said a prayer to Babaji. Babaji, bless me. Let me handle this. And I took the glass of water, and as I was swallowing the half of the pill, it was still in my throat, the pain vanished. There was no pain. It wasn't the pill that did it. I was still traveling. It hadn't dissolved. But I was so exhausted from this operation, blood, you know, it was just really bad, bandages all over my eye and everything. I told my wife, I said, you know, it's late in the day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a nap. I'm going to lay down a little bit because I'm exhausted. So I laid down. And it was dark in the room, and I'm laying down. And pretty soon I wake up because my, my pillow's wet. Sheets are wet. Blankets wet. And I go, oh my God, what? I hope nobody sees this because I must be a big baby. I must have been crying so hard. I wet the pillows and everything, you know. Must have been tears, right? It's like, so I come downstairs. I tell my wife, I said, I said, I, you're not proud of me, obviously, but I think I was really crying pretty bad up there because everything is soaking wet, you know, with my tears. She goes, well, let me go up there and take a look at this. So she comes down and she goes, and she's got all these sheets and everything. They're all bloodstained. Everything was blood. It wasn't tears. And she says, you weren't crying and you were bleeding. And I go, thank God it was blood, not tears. And, of course, she thought it was nuts at that point. But anyway, but I meant that. You know, it was a part of me saying, you know, uh, blood was okay. So that night I'm in bed. I'm sleeping in a separate room because I've got all this pain and everything. And four o'clock in the morning. Shiva hour. And uh, all of a sudden, the room is illuminated. I mean, illuminated. It's like you just took the sun, shrunk it down to the size of my wall, in fact, I couldn't see the ceilings and the floor. So it, it was at least the size of the wall and there was no borders. So it was just this huge disc sun. It should have been blinding me. It was so bright. But I'm watching it with one eye. The other eye is all bandaged up, but I got these. And I'm feeling bliss beyond bliss. I'm feeling love beyond love. I'm feeling, and I wrote this in the book, and I meant it, the love of a billion mothers. Talk about you didn't get love at home from your mother. This is the greatest. You got a billion of them loving you. It's unbelievable. It's like you've never been loved more. And then in the midst of this, as I'm just watching it, and here's what's interesting. My childlike mind, I'm accepting this as, yeah, this is cool. This is what happens. God's here for me. Yeah. 
Why shouldn't I be seeing this? There wasn't one question like, what is this? Who is this? What's going on? It was like, yes. I was just enjoying it. And then this long arm, no, no robe or not, just a, a, an arm, no clothing, and a hand reaches out from this disc of sun, this omnibus or whatever it was. And it reaches down and it covers my the, all the place that the surgery was at that day. The eye, the nose, everything. And just my body was just well, picture your greatest meditation experience you ever had. Multiply that by billions. That tingling kundalini energy in your spine. It's like a helicopter taking off. It's like a rocket ship. It's and it's all love. It's love. And I'm feeling this love. And there's no part of me that's worried about the surgery the next day. I'm not even thinking about it. I'm not thinking about the, the injury. I'm not thinking about nothing. I'm just thinking I'm loved. And I'm enjoying it. And I love God back. And I got this hand on my face, right? I had a feeling of who I thought it was, but I didn't want to say so. I kind of kept this secret. So a couple hours later, we're up. I tell my wife about it. She kind of, she's heard enough of my strange tales. And I told her and she, I believe she accepted it. So we went there the next, that morning. And that doctor, remember the guy with no bedside manner? The guy told me he's going to cut my lips, my ears, all this stuff. And he looks at me and says, yeah, it looks pretty bad. I got this stuff. This looks bad. He says, and he takes out this chart, a picture of my face with a graph on it. Sean is going to take all these stitches and cuts and stuff. He says, I've been working on this all last night. I've got it graphed out this morning. So I, He says, I've planned this. He says, I've done this for 30 years. I got it down. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I said, okay, you're the boss. So I go into surgery. I come out. And my wife comes in. And she's just staring at me. She's going, I go, what's wrong? And I'm thinking, what's wrong, right? She goes, they didn't touch your ears. They didn't touch your lips. They didn't touch your eyelid. They didn't They didn't do your your forehead. I go, really? She says, I had bandages on the nose. and They, they cut everything around all the meat, all the flesh around the, the tear duct was sitting by itself. And they rebuilt that. And I said, so she had demanded to see the doctor. And the doctor came on and goes, yeah, you know, it's really weird. I was in there in the surgery. Actually... He was out. We're ready to do the surgery. I got the instruments. I'm ready to start doing the cutting. And inspiration came to me to cut the shoulder and take the flesh from the shoulder and rebuild. He says, I've never done that. But I'm going to rebuild the nose from the shoulder. I didn't plan it. I didn't chart it. I didn't graft it. But it felt like something I should do. And so I did it. And then he didn't question why. Okay, fine. And then he goes, hey, by the way, he says, you know, like there's 68 stitches or something. I mean, there's a god-awful amount of stuff in there. And, you know, you're going to be in great pain tomorrow. Or, well, as soon as this wears off. So he gave me another bottle of Oxy. I go, I don't need it. I don't need it. So I went home that day. And my wife goes, I go, no. I proved I didn't need it yesterday. I don't need it today. So I didn't take it. I went in the bedroom. I went to bed. And at 4 o'clock... Zero four zero zero. The same exact experience I had the night before comes back and revisits me. Blazing sun. Hand reaching out. Hand on my face. And all I could feel was love. Healing love. I knew I was being healed in some way. And I knew there was a visitor there. I, I knew I knew who this was. And then... Three weeks later, I'm invited to a wedding. First, I canceled the wedding invitation because I didn't want to show up looking like a monster. But then it didn't look so bad. I had an eye patch on, which was kind of cool. I had a black eye patch, like, you know, I was an Israeli general or something. And uh, and the nose was, you know, stitches were out, so it wasn't too awful bad. And uh, Gornoff was there to help at the wedding. It was in Napa Valley, beautiful city. So we're sitting at this table with the wedding party. Or, or they were coming over to talk. And there was nine people there, all part of the same group. And Gurdjieff stops the conversation. He says, 
Bill, I said, just across from him. By the way, that experience you had the other night, I'm going, okay. He says, that wasn't a dream, wasn't an imagination, it wasn't a vision. It was real. And it was the big boss. Now, he calls the big boss Babaji. So it was the big boss. And of course, all the people go on. So I didn't break the news to the people. I was trying to keep it a secret. I didn't want to tell people and, and then tell people I think it's Babaji. Because that's just like, come on, how arrogant can you be? But he, he let it out of the bag. He told everybody, there it is. And I'm just kind of going. So it was one of those things that... And you hadn't told him you had had that experience, right? He, I don't know how he found out. I, I don't know what the deal was, but it was like, wow. It was like, is there anything secret in the universe? So <laughs> that was an experience. Uh, the only other kind of experience I had with a, with a, with a, a, a sphere of some kind, because you kind of had an interest in that. So let's go there. When I was in my 30s, living there in Oakland, and I was meditating down in my basement. I was meditating, really focused. And all of a sudden, the room lit up. I mean, lit up. And I felt somebody looking at me. This is one I can't explain. And it happened twice. And so I look up, and in the ceiling of the basement here is this orb about the size of a basketball. That's all, about the size of a basketball. But it's like, there's no, it's not solid. It's like spheres of light coming out, different shapes and sizes of light coming out of it. It's alive. It's pulsing. It's alive. It's alive light. It's, there's no other way to describe it. It's not even like crystal. And I just look at it. And I'm staring at it. I didn't say, hey, buddy, who are you? What's going on? Uh, let me draw this. Let me take a picture. Nothing. It was just... All kinds of time went by. It could have been 10 minutes. It could have been an hour. I have no clue. Time went by. And then all of a sudden, boom, explodes. And there's this sonic boom. I mean, as loud as a sonic boom. It shook everything. Boom. And it was like shards of glass. This light. The light was like solid chunks of light. Just penetrating my heart and my, and my spiritual eye and my crown chakra and and just and then like fireworks kind of there was nothing and I'm going that's exciting even for me I was fresh right so I go running out of the basement I go up the back porch I, I go in the house and I go I'm looking at my wife and kids I go did you guys hear that explosion no nobody heard nothing okay fine so when I was writing uh, this book Warrior and um, I was talking about that experience, and I wanted to say, geez, you know, if I really want to write about the experience, I should know something about it. You know, if that ever happens again, here's what I said to the universe, you know, if that ever happens again, I, I, I'm going to write down some questions. And I wrote down a, a sheet of paper. I had these questions sitting in the corner of my desk. I said, you know, if that ever happens again, I'm going to commit these, these up the questions to, to mind, and I'm going to ask None of this strange visiting. Stuff. I'm going to ask. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to ask, and I'm going to I'm going to time it. How long and everything else. I'm going to focus on this. And no sooner I'd written the list, made up my mind, that's what I was going to do. There it was. It was like it got called up. Okay, buddy. And then I'm looking up at this thing. I didn't ask one question. I had the questions right on a tablet. I didn't ask one question. I didn't time it. I had no clue. And then, bang. Shards of glass into my heart chakra, into my spiritual eye, into my crown chakra, just throat chakra, everything, just. And then I came out thinking, well, let's see. Did anybody hear anything? No, nobody heard nothing. But it was interesting that the experience happened twice, once, just out of the blue, and the second time when I was trying to write about that experience and remember what it was about and swore that I was going to ask questions. So the universe says, yeah, buddy, you're going to ask questions? Sure. Well, nothing. Blank mind. Like I said, I'm always out of my mind. So, and then the experience with the sun and the hand coming out, same experience twice, and then with somebody to verify it. And then the fact that the surgeon's hands motivated to do something entirely different. 
why would you do 30 years one way and then when this old fat old veteran comes in and you do something different for him come on there's something afloat there literally afloat right so the other unique experience we got time for another question um yeah a little bit more okay because i think one of the one of the, one of the more maybe this will be the last one okay let's give it let's let's end on up on a major one like in when you end up a fourth of july display you go right yeah the grand so let's end on the rainbow star story uh because you asked about a rainbow and i'm going to get a little bit deeper and that oh by the way thank that that wonderful person that lady that sent you the stories and the pictures of the owl that she raised mm. sacred tell her thank you blessings she wants to write me private give her she could she could contact me do so sure anyway uh, that's a, that was a beautiful thing for the people who haven't seen it. Uh, I, I recommend they do. Anyway, just for well, since you said that, it, it was um, Anamika Borst, whom I've interviewed. You'll find her on BatGap, and uh, you could contact her, and she'll send you her story about an owl. It's a very sweet story about how she adopted this owl when it was only like a, you know, the size of your thumb, and then it, she raised it up. Anyway, go ahead. It was a beautiful. It inspired me. Anyway, so I just pushing somebody else. It inspired me. So. I was meditating, I was married about three years or so, I had two kids, and uh, I was meditating, and I had this habit, when I got through my meditation downstairs, I'd get, I'd get in bed, I, I don't have just like, okay, now I've finished meditating, let's just go to sleep, no, I finished meditating, and on my nightstand next to my bed, on my side, I had I don't know if you can see that picture. That picture back there of Yogananda. Yo yeah. yeah, the last, the last photo mm -hmm. taken of him before he collapsed and died. Well, in fact, I think that's the same exact picture, different frame, but same exact picture. And it was sitting on my nightstand. And my habit was to stare at Yogananda. And and just, I love you. I love you. And I'm just staring at Yogananda's picture, I love you, I love you, I love you, and and next thing I know, I'm watching this face. You, you stare at any saints or sage faces, if you're really staring with great focus, they come alive for you. I mean, this is almost like a life. All right. But then, boom! All of a sudden, I'm this thin sheet of light. I'm this rainbow filament. I'm soup. It's like on Star Trek, you know, Star Trek, the hyperdrive, you know, warp drive, there they go, boom, there's this trail of colors. It's exactly what it was feel like. I was like traveling and it was just like Star Trek, I mean, going by. I was just going. And I was just enraptured. I was feeling so much love. I was this rainbow body. And I was traveling to realms of the inner cosmos or outer cosmos. I have no clue if it was interdimensional, outer dimensional, but it was not here uh, in that sense. And I'm traveling and I sense and I know that I'm not alone, that this rainbow body I'm in is a body, a community of consciousnesses, you know? There's that one great conscious, and this is like functioning like a body of, it's like your toes, your fingers are all part of this body, you know, and the cells, you know, they're all individual, but they're all functioning to help this one body. And that was kind of like what it felt like. I felt like I was functioning this rainbow body thing, um, which is strange, but I could hear colors. I could hear colors. I could see sounds. I could feel the emanation of love expanding everywhere. And at, at first, when I first had this experience, when I first talked about it, I talked about just going ultra fast, fast, fast. You know? And then I went to bed one night and I realized I wasn't traveling fast. I was expanding the consciousness expansion not travel which is a whole different concept just like but there was all these everything worlds and everything in this experience which only lasted one hour 
material world time. I felt I was gone two to three hundred million years. I mean, a lot of stuff just happened. And I knew the beginning of this and the end of this. I mean, and I was given information. And I was given certain things that I, that I needed to know. And then I was given things which I could never, I could never share. And then I was given things that you got amnesia on. You, you, you're not going to come back with that. And I had this interaction with the cosmic mind. It's the only way to say it. It was like all was one. It was like it was all one. I wasn't just this rainbow body. It was all one. I was the sound, the beautiful sound of Om, which is not even like anybody anybody can do here on Earth. That ultimate sound of creation. It's the sound of love. So all this was going along, and that was just it was a beautiful experience. And then, all of a sudden, I remembered my family, my wife and two children. Boom. 10,000 pounds back in a human body, right? And I go, oh my God. It was the memory of this material life and this now that instantaneously brought me back here. Instantaneous. Boom. Just boom. Even though I'd been there for a couple hundred million years doing this, it was a memory of a life here that I came back here, which is kind of an interesting philosophical question. So I woke up and I was bawling my eyes out. God, I hate to be married, man. My wife must go through it. She was wondering what the heck's going on with her husband. Anyway, but there was that great loss. Great loss. But it profoundly changed me in so many direct, <clears throat> indirect ways. And over the decades, unlayering it like, a, like an onion, just unlayering the different meanings and the different things I learned, I've come to realize it was so much greater than any other experience that I've ever, ever had. And also realize that I'm not alone in this rainbow body and that there are other people manifesting human bodies that are part of that rainbow body I was in. Like there are visitors here, but that's their real home. And maybe we each got a different rainbow body. I don't know. Maybe there's a group of scientists out there that got a special rainbow body. Maybe there's a group of of people that are bringing spiritual stuff. Maybe there's a group of people that are engineers and science. I'm, think, I'm thinking that maybe the world is being directed by these groups of like-minded entities, souls, consciousness, that are working on some aspect of our evolution. That was the thought I had when I came back. I can't prove it. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't read it anywhere, so I don't know. But it was a feeling that something to do with that and uh, I, I've, I found that to be uh, something comfortable with me to think yeah I, I have the same feeling uh, although I haven't had an experience like that obviously but um, I think your whole life is a testament to the idea that there's more to life than meets the eye there's more to the world that, than, than meets the eye and uh, I think it's not only comforting but inspiring and um, perhaps realistic to assume to understand that there are all kinds of higher levels of creation that may not be perceivable by the average person but that are that but that were perceivable to them and that they're very much um, involved in helping to orchestrate human affairs and, somebody and out there loves us. yeah Irene said somebody else there out there loves us you know keep us from blowing us, keep us from She's blowing right. ourselves up and at the same time you know shepherd along our, our development our evolution as as a planet as a species yeah it's a and Yogananda talks a lot about that obviously and many people I've interviewed have had experiences along those lines and there's all kinds of books you can read about it so I don't think it's just sort of wishful thinking or fantasy indulgence or anything like that I think it probably is an indication of how the universe is actually operating. Yeah, but there, there seems to be a plan. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of these guys, I don't question nothing. I'm, I'm happy. If I was, if, if this whole answer to this cosmic thing 
was a jigsaw puzzle. And I was just one of the border pieces, but I wasn't the flower in the middle with all the colors. It wouldn't bother me. I'm happy being one piece of the puzzle. Sure. Because I know they can't finish that piece of puzzle until I'm in plugged in, right? <laughs> so I think each of us is a piece of that jigsaw puzzle, that spiritual jigsaw puzzle. And, and I really do believe that ultimately we're already there. And you talked about it on some of your talks. I've watched some of your videos that people talk about climbing a mountain and stuff, you know, and there's many different trails to it. Because I always like that as an example because you want to go to the top of the mountain, you want to take a Sherpa that's been to the top of that particular mountain. But he hooks everybody up to a rope and you can have somebody down in the valley on that same rope the rest of the guys are at the top, guys are in the middle. But you know what? Everybody that's tied to that rope is going to get to the top of the mountain. And it's just a matter of time. And since time is not real, right? Yeah. There's no time. So it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, you know, you just reminded me of John Donne's poem as you were speaking, and I just looked it up. It's, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I love that quote. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. But that's true. We're all, every, that's why to get back to that original statement we started off earlier. Nobody's special because we're all special. Mm -hmm. And if we're all special, then nobody's special. Right back to that. We're all one. So who you choose to be your teacher, who you choose to be your guru, there's only one guru. There's that one guru within you, with outside you. When you worship a guru, whoever you pick, it doesn't matter. If you see the one guru in your guru, it's interesting because... People criticize whatever guru we're, you know, they, oh, this guy does this, this guy, he's human, he does this. You know what? I think how you see your guru says a lot about the devotee. If you see your guru as a crook, as a fake, as a fraud, as a cheater, as, you know, an idiot, that's what they are to you. But if you see in your guru that one God, regardless of what the physical guru you see that one guru, that God in him, then you actually see in the face of God while you're alive. Yeah. And so, and that's a reflection upon the student, the devotee, the disciple. So all these people, uh, this, no, stop and think. It's a reflection upon you, the follower. So, which is, which does not absolve gurus from, hey, no, you know, that's their, their responsibility, but you have a point. It. You have a point, but that's, which, but that's which, up to them. Yeah, that's up to them. You know, they, they everybody's got to answer for whatever it is. But you know, uh, if we spend our time focusing on us and improving us, and less time worrying about everybody else's faults, we're going to get someplace. And, and right now, we're living in a society. It's really terrible out there right now because I don't even dare talk politics because <laughs> I disagree with them all. Because I'm going. Both sides are terrible. One's going so crazy this way. One's going so crazy this way. Nobody ever says, let's work together. Let's compromise. Let's find something that's of equal value. I'm a man without a party. I'm a man without a candidate. But I got hope. And I got that one guru within me. And I'm hoping that this nation, this country, this world, this cosmos, will focus on that one guru within and we'll all come to the same understanding. So that's where I'm going. And, and I don't know if I'm going to be there successful. But meanwhile, I'm going out there trying to help one vet at a time, one person at a time. I don't just help veterans in case somebody's out there. And if somebody wants to come and buy my books, they're on Amazon. Uh, I'll be linking to them. And, and, there's, and there's links from my website. They go to my website. Uh, I'm here. I'm available. I got YouTube videos out there if you want stuff, individual stories. This video itself will probably add some power and impact to people who really want to hear me. Um, I am just a messenger, and I am not the message. And I think a lot of people come on your shows and basically echoed that same thing. It's, it's the message that we're all sending out. And I think the common 
line that we're all being drawn in the sand here. It's all about love. It's all about love. And if it's not, why are we here? Yeah. The Beatles had so, it right. Yeah, because people ask, well, why are we here? What's, what's the purpose of my life? To love and serve. And you can narrow that down to just love. Because serving with love, love is service. I mean, it's love. Love. <laughs> Great. Well, that's a good place to wrap it up. Can't can't get any better than that. Well, namaste. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, occupy this cyberspace with you. Sure. It was an honor. This this will live longer than the both of us. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah, I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you a lot, Bill. I really have enjoyed this whole week, you know, kind of reading your books and listening to your videos and then have this... this um, conversation has been the icing on the cake so it's, I really appreciate your time no accidents somehow we connected and thank Irene for that and uh, blessings and peace to you my friend yeah let me just make a little concluding remark here so I've been speaking with Bill McDonald um, and as always I'll have a page on Batgap about him and about this interview and with links to his YouTube channel and his books and so on um, when you're there if you go there um, check out the other menus. There are things you can, uh, you know, subscribe to an email or, or um, you know, subscribe to the audio podcast or whatever interests you. Check out the different menus. And uh, this is part of an ongoing series, as I said in the beginning. Uh, there's an upcoming interviews page where, where you will see who we've got scheduled. Take a look at that. Um, you can actually sign up to be notified of those things. There's a little calendar thing that you can fill out to get a notification when a, an interview is going to be aired because a lot of people like to watch them live and um, about 150 people on today for this one uh, you can you can send in questions during or before the live interviews um, if you wish to do so and there's uh, a form for that at the bottom of that upcoming interviews page and Rick if because if, yes. if, I didn't answer a lot of questions if you can forward Feel free to forward any questions to me with the people's email address or Facebook, whatever it is, and I will personally answer any question that comes in. Okay. Do you want me to put your email address on your BatGap yeah. page? Yeah. All right, I'll do that. Good. So uh, we'll have your email address on there. If it gets to be too much, let me know. I'll take it off again. But I'll no, put, that's that's I'll put what it I do. There. <laughs> that's what I do. Okay, good. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks for your time, and uh, thanks to those who've been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.